Visions 1 and 2 of The Shepherd of Hermas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas. Translated by Charles Taylor. Visions 1 and 2. First Vision, Chapter 1. He that bred me up sold me to a lady, Rhoda, at Rome. Many years after I knew her again, and began to love her as a sister. After a while I saw her bathing in the river Tiber, and I reached out my hand to her, and led her up out of the river. Then seeing her beauty, I communed in my heart, saying, Happy were I, had I such an one for beauty and disposition to wife. That only I thought to myself, and nothing more. After a certain time, as I was on the way to Cumae, and was lauding the creations of God, that are so great and noble and mighty, as I walked I fell asleep, and a spirit took me and carried me away across a pathless region, through which no man could journey, for it was rugged and broken up by watercourses. But when I had crossed the river, there I came to the plain ground, and I knelt down and began to pray unto the Lord, and to make confession of my sins. Then as I prayed, the heaven was opened, and I beheld the lady whom I had desired greeting me from heaven, saying, Hail, Hermas. And I gazed at her and said, Lady, what dost thou hear? She answered and said to me, I was received up to reprove thy sins before the Lord. I said to her, Dost thou now accuse me? Nay, quoth she, but hear the things which I will tell thee. God who dwelleth in the heavens and who created the things that are out of nothing, and increased and multiplied them for the sake of his holy church, is wroth with thee, because thou hast sinned against me. I answered, and I said to her, I sinned against thee? How? Spake I ever an unseemly word to thee? Did I not always esteem thee as a goddess? Did I not always reverence thee as a sister? Why, lady, dost thou falsely lay these evil and unclean things to my charge? Then she, smiling upon me, said, The desire of naughtiness arose in thine heart. Seemeth it not to thee to be an evil deed to a righteous man, that the desire of wickedness should enter into his heart? Yea, it is sin, great sin, quoth she. For the righteous man purpose righteous things, and his purposes, being righteous, his repute is established in the heavens. And he findeth favor with the Lord in all his doings. But they who purpose wickedness in their hearts draweth death and captivity unto themselves, especially they that set their affection on this world, and boast themselves in their riches, and lay not hold on the good things to come. Their souls shall rue it, seeing they have no hope, but have renounced themselves and their life. But do thou pray unto God, and he shall heal thy sins, and the sins of all thy house, and of all the saints. Chapter 2 After she had spoken these things, the heavens were shut up, and I was all quaking and sorrowing. And I said within myself, If even this sin is laid to my charge, how is it possible I should be saved? How shall I make atonement to God for my sins that are full grown? Or with what words shall I pray the Lord to be forgiving unto me? While I was considering these things and debating in my heart, I saw over against me a great white chair of snowy wool. And there came an ancient dame in brightly shining raiment, holding a book in her hands. And she sat down alone and saluted me, saying, Hail Hermas. And I, sorrowing and weeping, said, Hail Lady. And she said to me, Why art thou gloomy, Hermas? Why art so patient and calm, and want to be always laughing? Why thus downcast, and look, and cheerless? And I said to her, Because of a most gracious lady, which saith that I sinned against her. Quoth she, Far be this thing from the servant of God. But of a surety something about her came into thy heart. Such intent maketh the servants of God guilty of sin. For it is a wicked and mad intent, in an all-revered and tried spirit, that it should desire an evil deed, especially the chaste Hermas, who withheld himself from every sinful lust, 
and is full of all simplicity and great innocency. Chapter 3. Howbeit, it is not for this that God is angry with thee, but to the end that thou shouldest convert thine house, which have rebelled against the Lord, and you their parents. Being fond of thy children, thou didst not admonish thine house, but suffered it to be terribly corrupted. Therefore is the Lord angry with thee. But he will heal all the former ills of thine house, for through their sins and unlawful deeds thou hast been corrupted by the affairs of this life. Yet the Lord in his abundant mercy hath pity on thee and thine house, and will strengthen and establish thee in his glory. Only be thou not slothful, but be of good courage and strengthen thy house. For as the smith by hammering his work prevaileth in the thing that he designeth, so the righteous word, spoken day by day, prevaileth over all wickedness. Without ceasing, therefore, admonish thy children, for I know that if they will repent with their whole heart, they shall be inscribed in the books of life with the saints. When these her words had ceased, she said to me, Wouldest thou hear me read? And I said, Lady, I would. She said to me, Be attentive, and hear the glories of God. And I heard, in great and wondrous wise, that which I had not the ability to remember. For all the words were fearsome, such as no man could bear. So I remembered the last words, for they were profitable to us and gentle. Behold the Lord of hosts, who by his unseen mighty power and great understanding created the world, and by his glorious counsel clad his creation with beauty, and by his strong word made the heaven fast, and founded the earth upon the waters, and by his peculiar wisdom and providence created his holy church, which also he blessed. Behold, he removeth the heavens and the mountains and the hills and the seas, and all things are made plain to his elect, that he may render unto them the promise which he promised with great glory and joy, if so be they observe the ordinances of God, which they received with great faith. Chapter 4 Now when she had finished reading and was risen from the chair, four young men came and took up the chair and went away towards the east. And she called me to her and touched me on the breast and said to me, did my reading please thee? And I said to her, Lady, these last words please me, but the former were hard and harsh. Quoth she to me, These last are for the righteous, but the former were for the heathen and the apostates. While she yet spake with me, certain two men appeareth, and lifted her in their arms, and went away towards the east, where also the chair was. And she departed gladly, and as she was going, she said to me, Be manful, Hermas. Second Vision, Chapter 1 As I was faring to Cume, about the same season as the year before, as I walked I called to mind the vision of the former year. And again a spirit taketh me and carrieth me away to the same place as the year before. And when I was come to the place, I bowed my knees and began to pray to the Lord, and to glorify his name, for that he had counted me worthy and made me to know my former sins. And when I was risen from prayer, I saw over against me the aged woman, whom I had seen the year before, walking about and reading a little book. And she said to me, Canst thou repeat these things to the elect of God? I said to her, Lady, so many things I cannot remember, but give me the little book that I may copy it. Take it, quoth she, but give it back to me. So I took it and withdrew to a certain place in the country, and I copied it all letter by letter, not being able to make out the syllables. Now when I had finished the letters of the little book, suddenly it was caught out of my hand, but by whom I saw not. Chapter 2 Fifteen days after, when I had fasted and besought the Lord much, the knowledge of the writing was revealed to me, and this is what was written. Thy seed, Hermas, have been disobedient unto God, and have blasphemed the Lord, and have betrayed their parents with great wickedness. 
and being reputed betrayers of parents, when they had betrayed them, they were not bettered, but added yet wicked lewdness and pollutions to their sins. Thus have they filled up the measure of their iniquities. But do thou acquaint all thy children with these words, and thy consort, who shall henceforth be to thee a sister, for she too refraineth not her tongue, whereby she doeth wickedly. Howbeit, when she hath heard these words, she will refrain, and she will find mercy. After thou hast made known to them these words, which the Master commanded me to reveal unto thee, then shall all their sins, which they committed, before be forgiven them. Yea, and all the saints who have sinned unto this day shall be forgiven, if they repent with their whole heart, and remove doubts from their minds. For the Master has sworn by his glory, touching his elect, that if there be more sinning after this day, which he hath limited, they shall not obtain salvation. For the repentance of the righteous hath an end. The days of repentance for all the saints are fulfilled. But for the heathen there is repentance unto the last day. Thou shalt charge them, therefore, that have the rule over the church, to order their ways in righteousness, that they may receive the promises to the full with much glory. Stand fast, then, ye that work righteousness, and be not of doubtful mind, that your passing may be with the holy angels. Happy are all ye that endure the great affliction which is to come, and that shall not deny their life, for the Lord has sworn by his Son, that they who deny their Lord shall surely be disowned of their life, to wit, they that shall now deny him in the days which are coming. But to such as denied before he was forgiving because of his abundant mercy. Chapter 3 And do thou, Hermas, no longer bear malice against thy children, nor neglect thy sister, to the end that they may be cleansed from their former sins. For they shall be corrected with just correction, if thou rememberest not evil against them. Remembrance of evil worketh death. Thou, Hermest, hath had great troubles of thine own through the transgressions of thine house, because thou hast no care for them, but wast unmindful and entangled in thine evil affairs. But thou art saved because thou didst not fall away from the living God, and by thine simplicity and continence these things have saved thee, if only thou continue in them, and they save all who do such like things, and walk in innocency and simplicity. These prevail against all wickedness, and continue unto life eternal. Happy are all that work righteousness, they shall never be destroyed. But say to Maximus, Behold, affliction cometh. If it seem good to thee, deny again. The Lord is nigh unto them that turn again. As it is written in the book of Eldad and Modad, who prophesied to the people in the wilderness. Chapter 4 And when I was asleep, brethren, a revelation was made to me by a very comely young man, who said unto me, Whom thinkest thou that the aged woman is from, whom thou hast receiveth the little book? Quoth I, The Sibyl. Thou dost err, quoth he, she is not. Who then is she, quoth I? The church, quoth he. I said to him, Why then is she old? Because, quoth he, she was created first of all things, therefore she is old. And for her sake the world was framed. Afterwards I saw a vision in my house. The aged woman came, and asked me if I had already given the book to the elders. I said that I had not. Thou hast well done, quoth she, for I have words to add. When therefore I have finished all the words, they shall be made known by thee to all the elect. Thou shalt therefore write two little books, and shalt send one to Clement, and one to Agrapte. Clement then shall send to the cities which are without, for that is his commission. And Agrapte shall admonish the widows and orphans, and thou shalt read to the city with the elders that preside over the church. End of Visions 1 and 2
Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Third Vision, Chapter 1. What I saw, brethren, was on this wise. When I had fasted oft and prayed the Lord to declare to me the revelation which he had promised to show me through that aged woman, in that night she appeared and said to me, Since thou art thus importunate and zealous to know all things, go now into the country where thou farmest, and about the fifth hour I will appear unto thee, and will show thee the things which thou must see. I asked her, saying, Lady, to what place in the country? Where thou wilt, quoth she. Then I chose out a goodly retired spot. But before I had spoken to her and told her the place, she said to me, I will come there where thou wilt. So I went into the country, brethren, and counted up the hours, and came to the place that I had appointed for her to come. And I saw an ivory bench set there, and on the bench lay a linen pillow, and over it was spread out a linen cloth of fine flax. Seeing these things lying, and no man in the place, I was sore amazed, and as it were, trembling seized me, and my hair stood up, and a horror came upon me, because I was alone. Coming, however, to myself, and calling to mind the glory of God, and taking courage, I bowed my knees, and began to confess my sins again to the Lord as before. Then she came with the six young men whom I had seen before, and stood by me, and listened as I prayed and confessed my sins to the Lord. And she touched me, and said, Cease, Hermas, to pray all about thy sins. Ask for righteousness also, that thou mayest straightway receive some part thereof for thine house. And she raised me up by the hand, and led me to the bench, and said to the young men, Go and build. And when the young men were gone, and we were left alone, she said to me, Sit down here. I said to her, Lady, let the elder first be seated. Sit down, quoth she, as I bid thee. Then, when I would have sat down on the right side, she suffered me not, but beckoned to me with her hand to sit on the left. And as I thought thereon, and was sad because she suffered me not to sit on the right side, she said to me, Grievest thou Hermas? The place is on the right for others, who have already pleased God, and suffered for the name's sake. Thou comest far short of sitting with them, but continue as thou dost in thy singleness, and thou shalt sit with them, and so shall all who do their works, and bear what they have borne. Chapter 2 What, quoth I, did they bear? Hearken, quoth she, scourgings, imprisonments, great afflictions, crosses, wild beasts for the name's sake. Therefore the right side of holiness belongeth to them, and to all who suffer for the name, and to the rest belongeth the left side. Nevertheless, both they that sit on the right and they that on the left have the same gifts, and the same promises, only that those are seated on the right hand, and have a certain glory. Thou art full of longing to sit on the right hand with them, yet thy feelings are many, but thou shalt be purged from them, and all who doubt not shall be purged from all their sins unto this day. When she had thus spoken, she would have departed, but I fell at her feet and besought her by the Lord to show me the vision which she promised. Then she took me again by the hand, and raised me up, and seated me at the bench on the left side. And she herself sat on the right. Lifting up a certain bright wand, she said to me, Seest thou some great thing? I said to her, Lady, I see nothing. She said to me, Lo, seest thou not over against thee a great tower, being builded by four square stones upon the waters? Now the tower was being built four square by six young men who came with her, and myriads more of men were bringing stones, some from the deep and some from the land, and were giving them to the six young men, and they were taking them and building. All the stones drawn from the deep they put into the building as they were, for they were fitly shapen and answerable in their joining to the other stones. And they so clave to one another that no joint appeared, 
but the whole tower seemed to be built of one stone. But some of the other stones, which were brought from the dry land, they rejected, and some they put into the building, and some they hewed in pieces, and hurled far from the tower. And many other stones lay round about the tower, and they were not using them for the building, for some of them were scabbed, and some had cracks, and some were stunted, and others were white but round, and would not fit into the building. And I saw other stones flung far from the tower, and lighting on the way, and not remaining in it, but rolling off to where there was no way, and others falling upon fire and being burned, and others falling near water, but unable to roll into it, although they would fain have rolled and come to the water. Chapter 3 When she had showed me these things, she would have run away. But I said to her, Lady, what doth it profit me to have seen these things, and not know what they mean? She answered me, saying, Thou art a knavish fellow, desiring to know all about the tower. Yea, quoth I, lady, so that I may tell my brethren, and they may be the more glad, and when they have heard these things, may know the Lord in much glory. Then quoth she, Many shall hear, but when they have heard, some of them shall rejoice, and some weep. Howbeit, these also, if they hear and repent, shall likewise rejoice. Hear then the parables of the tower, for I will reveal all things unto thee, and then trouble me no more about revelation, for these revelations have an end, seeing they are fulfilled. Yet thou wilt not cease to ask for revelations, for thou art shameless. The tower which thou seest building is myself, the church, which have appeared to thee even now and before time. Wherefore, ask what thou wilt concerning the tower, and I will reveal it unto thee, that thou mayest rejoice with the saints. I said to her, Lady, seeing thou hast once judged me worthy to whom to reveal all things, do thou reveal them. And she said to me, Whatsoever is possible should be revealed to thee shall be revealed. Only let thy heart be toward God, and doubt not at whatsoever thou seest. I asked her, Lady, why is the tower built upon the waters? I told thee before, quoth she, and thou inquirest diligently, and so inquiring thou findest the truth. Hear then why the tower is built upon the water. It is because your life was saved, and shall be saved by water. But the tower was founded by the word of the Almighty and Glorious Name, and it is held fast by the unseen power of the Master. Chapter 4 I answered and said to her, Lady, this thing is great and wondrous, but who are the six men that were building? These, said she, are the holy angels of God, which were first created, to whom the Lord delivered his whole creation, to increase and build it and to rule over it. By their hand, therefore, must the building of the tower be accomplished. But those others who were bringing the stones, who are they? They also, she said, are holy angels of God, but those six are more excellent than they. And when the building of the tower is finished, then all shall rejoice together round about the tower, and shall glorify God, because the building of the tower is accomplished. Then I asked her, saying, Lady, I would know what event happeneth to the stones, and what is the meaning of them. She answered and said to me, not because thou art of all men the most worthy, to have things revealed to thee. For there are others before thee, and better than thou, to whom these visions should have been revealed. But to the end that the name of God may be glorified, they have been revealed, and shall be revealed to thee, because of the double-minded, who debate in their hearts whether these things be so or not. Say unto them that all these things are true, and nothing is beside the truth, but all is firm and sure and established. Chapter 5 Hear now about the stones that went into the building, the square white stones which agree in their joinings. These are the apostles and bishops and teachers and deacons who walk in godly gravity and ministered purely and gravely as bishops and teachers and deacons 
to the elect of God, of whom some are fallen asleep, and some yet are. And they always agreed together, and had peace among themselves, and hearkened to one another. Therefore do their joinings agree in the structure of the tower. And who are they that are drawn from the deep and put to the building, which agree in their joinings with the other stones, that were already laid? These are they which have suffered for the name of the Lord. And the other stones that were fetched from the dry land, I would know, lady, what they are. Quoth she, They that went into the building, without being hewn, are those whom the Lord approved, because they walked in the straight way of the Lord, and directed themselves in his commandments. And those that were brought and put into the building, what are they? They are the young in faith and faithful. They are admonished by the angels to do good, because wickedness was found in them. And those which they rejected and flung away, what are they? These are they that have sinned and are minded to repent. Wherefore, they are not flung far from the tower, because they will be useful for the building if they repent. They then that are to repent, if they repent, shall be strong in the faith, if they repent now while the tower is in building. But if the tower be finished, then they have no longer room, but shall be castaways. Only this they have, that they lie near the tower. Chapter 6 And what dost thou know about the stones that were hewn in pieces and flung far from the tower? These are the children of iniquity, and they received the faith in hypocrisy, and no wickedness departed from them. Wherefore they have not salvation, because they are not of use for building by reason of their wickedness. Therefore they were broken up and hurled far away, because of the anger of the Lord, for they provoked him to anger, and of the many others which thou sawest lying about, and not going into the building, these that are scabbed are they that knew the truth, but remained not therein, nor clave to the saints. For this cause they are useless. And what are they that have the clefts? These are they that have divisions of heart against one another, and are not peaceable among themselves, but have the look of peace. And when they go away from one another, their wickedness remaineth in their hearts. These are the clefts which those stones have. And they that are stunted are they that have believed, and are for the more part righteous, but have some parts in them of iniquity. Therefore are they maimed and not whole. And the white round stones which do not fit into the building, what are they, lady? She answered and said to me, How long wilt thou be foolish and without understanding, asking about everything and discerning nothing? These are they that have faith, but have also the riches of this world. By reason of their wealth and their traffic, when affliction ariseth, they deny their Lord. And I answered and said to her, When, lady, will they be of use for the building? Quoth she, When the wealth which captiveth them shall have been cut off, then they shall be serviceable to God. For as the round stone, except it be chipped and lose somewhat of itself, cannot become square, so the rich of this world, except the riches be pared away, cannot become meat for the Lord's use. Know this from experience of thyself. When thou wast rich, thou wast nothing worth, but now thou art profitable and good for the use of life. Be ye profitable to God, for thou thyself also profitest out of the same stones. Chapter 7 And the other stones, which thou sawest flung far from the tower, and falling on to the way, and rolling out of it, to where there was no way, these are they that have believed, but because of their double mind they forsake their true way. Thinking then that they can find a better way, they wander and are hardly beset, walking about where there are no ways. And they that fell into the fire and were burned, these are they that utterly fell away from the living God. And it never again came into their heart to repent, because of their wanton desires and their wickedness, which they committed. And the others which fell near the water, but could not roll into it, 
wilt thou know what they are these are they that have heard the word and are minded to be baptized in the name of the lord then when they bethink them of the purity of the truth they repent and go again after their evil desires so she finished the explanation of the tower but being unabashed i went on to ask her whether all the stones that were cast away would not fit into the structure of the tower might repent and have place in this tower they may repent quoth she but they cannot fit into this tower but they shall fit into another much lesser place and this after they have been tormented and have fulfilled the days of their sins and for this cause they shall be removed because they have been partakers of the word of righteousness and then it shall happen to them to be released from their torments if so they take thought of the evil deeds which they have committed but if not then they cannot be saved because of the hardness of their hearts chapter eight then when i had done asking her about all these things she said to me wilt thou see somewhat else and being full of longing to behold i was very glad that i might see it and looking at me and smiling a little she said to me seest thou seven women round the tower i see them lady quoth i this tower she said is upholden by them according to the command of the lord hear now their operations the first of them the one clenching her hands is named faith through her the elect of god are saved the next that is girded and manlike is called continence she is the daughter of faith whoso followeth her becometh happy in his days because he will refrain from all evil deeds believing that if he refrain from every evil desire he shall inherit life eternal and the rest lady what are they they are daughters one of another and they are called one of them simplicity one knowledge one innocence one modesty one love when therefore thou doest all the works of their mother thou canst live i would know quoth i lady what virtue each one of them hath here quoth she the powers which they possess their powers are knit together and follow one another even as they are born of faith is born continence of continence simplicity of simplicity innocence of innocence modesty of modesty knowledge of knowledge love their works then are pure and revered and divine whosoever therefore shall serve these women and prevail to lay hold on their works he shall have his habitation in the tower with the saints of god then i asked her concerning the times whether the full end was yet and she cried with a loud voice saying o foolish man seest thou not the tower yet a building when this shall have done being built then cometh the end howbeit it shall quickly be built up henceforth ask me nothing sufficient for thee and for the saints is this notification and the renewal of your spirits not however for thyself alone have these things been revealed but to the intent that thou mayest show them to all after three days for thou must first understand them i charge thee hermas to speak all these things which i am about to say to thee in the ears of the saints that they may hear and do them and may be cleansed from their iniquities and thou with them chapter nine hearken unto me ye children i bred you up in much simplicity and innocence and modesty for the mercy of the lord who shed righteousness upon you that ye might be justified and sanctified from all wickedness and perverseness yet ye will not cease from your wickedness now therefore hearken unto me and have peace among you and visit and help one another and partake not by yourselves alone of the creatures of god in abundance but give a share also to them that need for some by excess of meats contract infirmity of the flesh and injure their flesh whereas the flesh of them that lack meats is harmed by their not having sufficiency of food and their body is consumed this separateness therefore is hurtful to you that have and impart not to them that need look to the judgment that cometh ye therefore who have abundantly seek out them that hunger while the tower is yet unfinished for after it is finished 
ye shall desire to do good, but shall not have opportunity. Beware then, ye that boast yourselves in your riches, lest they that are in want groan, and their groanings go up to the Lord, and with your abundant goods ye be shut outside the door of the tower. Now therefore I say unto you that rule over the church, and that have the chief seats, be ye not like to poisoners. Now they carry their drugs in boxes, but ye carry your drug and venom in your heart. Ye are hardened, and will not cleanse your hearts, and mingle your minds together with a pure heart, that ye may obtain mercy from the great king. Take heed, therefore, children, lest your dissensions bereave you of your life. How desire ye to instruct the Lord's elect, when as ye yourselves have not instruction? Wherefore, instruct one another, and be at peace among yourselves, that I, for my part, may stand with joy before the Father to give account of you all unto your Lord. Chapter 10 And when she had done speaking with me, the six young men that builded came and carried her away to the tower, and other four took up the bench and carried that also to the tower. The face of these I saw not, for they were turned away from me. And as she was going, I prayed her to explain to me about the three forms in which she appeared to me. She answered and said to me, Concerning these things thou must ask some other, that they may be revealed to thee. Now she was seen of me, brethren, in the first vision a year ago well, stricken in age and sitting on a chair. In the next vision she was younger in face, but had aged flesh and hair, and she talked with me standing. And she was more cheerful than before. But in the third vision she was altogether youthful and of excellent beauty. Only her hair was aged. And she was quite joyous and sat on a bench. Therefore I was sore vexed, wanting to know this revelation. And I beheld the aged woman in a night vision, saying unto me, All prayer requireth humiliation. Fast, therefore, and thou shalt receive that thou askest from the Lord. So I fasted one day, and in the same night a young man appeared, and said to me, Seeing that thou prayest earnestly without ceasing for revelations, beware, lest by much asking thou hurt thy flesh. These revelations are sufficient for thee. Art thou able to see mightier revelations than those thou hast seen? I answered and said to him, Sir, this only I ask, to have full revelation concerning the three forms of the aged woman. He answered and said to me, For how long are ye without understanding? Your double minds make you of no understanding, and your not having your heart set on the Lord. I answered him again, saying, But from thee, sir, we shall learn those things more perfectly. Chapter 11 here quoth he, concerning the three forms about which thou inquirest. In the first vision, wherefore, she did appear to thee aged and sitting in a chair, because your spirit was aged and already faded, and powerless from your ailings and doubts. For as the age have no hope any more to renew their youth, expect nothing but their last sleep. So ye, being weakened by worldly affairs, yield yourselves up to weariness and cast not your cares upon the Lord. But your spirit was broken, and ye were worn out with your griefs. Then I would fain know, sir, why she sat on a chair. Because, said he, every sick person sitteth on a chair by reason of his infirmity, that the weakness of his body may be comforted. There thou hast now the figure of the first vision. Chapter 12 and in the second vision thou sawest her standing, and with her face younger and more cheerful than before, but her flesh and her hair aged. Here quoth he this parable also, as when one stricken in years is already past hope of himself because of his infirmity and his poverty, and expecteth nothing but the last day of his life. Then suddenly an inheritance is left him, and on hearing thereof he ariseth and is very glad, and putteth on strength, and no longer reclineth, but standeth up, and his spirit, which was already wasted by his former doings, is renewed. And he no longer sitteth down, but is a man again. 
so were ye also when ye heard the revelation which the Lord revealed to you. For he had compassion upon you, and renewed your spirits, and ye put off your ailments, and vigor came to you, and ye were strengthened in the faith. And the Lord, seeing you made strong, rejoiced. Wherefore he showed you the building of the tower, and he will show you other things, if with all your heart ye be at peace among yourselves. Chapter 13 And in the third vision thou sawest her younger and beautiful and joyous and fair of form. For as when glad tidings come to one that sorroweth, he straightway forgetteth his former sorrows, and heedeth nothing else but the news he hath heard, and is strengthened thenceforth unto good, and his spirit is renewed by the joy which he received. So ye likewise were renewed in your spirits when ye saw these good things. And for that thou sawest her seated on a bench, the position is a strong one, for the bench hath four feet and standeth firmly. For even so the world is held fast by four elements. They therefore that repent shall be wholly young again and established, if they repent with their whole heart. Thou hast now the entire revelation, Ask me no more for any revelation, but if there be need of any, it shall be revealed to thee. End of Third Vision Visions 4 and 5 of Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourth Vision, Chapter 1 the vision which I saw, brethren, twenty days after my former vision, was for a type of the tribulation that is to come. I was going into the country by the Champagne Road. From the highway it is about ten furlongs, and the place is easily traversed. Walking therefore alone, I prayed the Lord to complete the revelations and visions which he showed me through his holy church, that he might confirm me and give repentance to his servants who had stumbled, that so his great and honorable name might be glorified, because he had accounted me worthy that he should show me his wonders. And as I glorified and thanked him, a sound like a voice answered me, saying, Doubt not, Hermas. And I began to reason within myself and say, What occasion have I to doubt that I am thus settled by the Lord and have seen glorious things? And I went on a little, brethren, and lo, I spied dust rising as it were to heaven. And I began to say within myself, Are cattle coming, and rising a dust? For it was distant from me about a furlong. As the dust went on increasing, I suspected that it was some portent. Then the sun gleamed out a little, and lo, I saw a very great beast like a leviathan, and out of his mouth went fiery locusts. The beast was in length about a hundred feet, and had a head, as it were, of tiling. And I began to weep, and pray the Lord to deliver me from it. And I remembered the word I had heard. Doubt not, Hermas. Putting on, therefore, brethren, the faith of the Lord, and calling to mind the marvels which he had taught me, I took courage, and gave myself to the beast. And the beast was coming on, so with a whir, as if he could make havoc of a city. I came close to him, and that so great beast stretched himself out along the ground, and did nothing but put forth his tongue, and moved not at all, until I had passed him by. Now the beast had on its head four colors, black, then like fire and blood, then golden, then white. Chapter 2. After I had passed by the beast, and gone forward about thirty feet, lo, there met me a virgin, decked as if coming forth from the bride chamber, all in white and with white sandals, veiled to the forehead and capped with a turban. And she had white hair, and I knew from the former visions that she was the church, and I was the more joyful. She saluted me and said, Hail, O man! And I, in reply, saluted her, Lady Hale. She answered and said to me, Did nothing meet thee? I said to her, Yea, lady, such a monster as could destroy tribes of people. 
but by the might of the Lord and his much compassion I escaped it. Thou didst well escape, quoth she, because thou didst cast thy care upon God, and open thy heart to the Lord, believing that thou canst be saved by none other than by the great and glorious name. Therefore the Lord sent his angel, and is over the beasts, whose name is Sagri, and he shut its mouth, that it should not hurt thee. Thou hast escaped a great tribulation by reason of thy faith, and because thou didst not doubt when thou sawest so great a beast. Go therefore and rehearse the mighty acts of the Lord to his elect, and say unto them that this beast is a figure of the great affliction that is for to come. If therefore ye prepare yourselves and repent with your whole heart unto the Lord, ye shall be able to escape it. If your heart be pure and without spot, and ye serve the Lord blamelessly all the rest of your days, Cast your cares upon the Lord, and he will right them. Believe in the Lord, ye double-minded, because he can do all things. He both turneth away his anger from you, and sendeth plagues upon such of you as are double-minded. Woe to them that hear these words and hear amiss. Better word for them not to have been born. Chapter 3 I asked her about the four colors on the head of the beast. And she answering me said, Art thou again curious about such matters? Yea, lady, quoth I, acquaint me what these things be. Hearken, quoth she, the black is this world wherein ye dwell, and the color of fire and blood figure that this world must perish by blood and fire. The golden part are ye that have escaped this world, for as gold is tried by the fire and made profitable, so are ye also tried that dwell among men. Ye therefore that abide, and are tried as with fire, shall be thereby purified. As the gold casteth off its droth, so ye shall cast away all sorrow and straightness, and shall be purified, and be useful for the building of the tower. And the white part is the world to come, in which the elect of God shall dwell. For they shall be without spot, and pure that have been chosen of God unto life eternal. Cease thou not, therefore, to speak in the ears of the saints. Ye have now likewise the figure of the great tribulation that is coming. If ye will, it shall be nothing. Remember the things before written. When she had spoken thus much, she departed. But I saw not whither she went. For there was a crashing, and I turned behind me, being affrighted, thinking that the beast was coming. Vision 5 and the Mandates Fifth Vision When I had prayed at home and sat down upon the couch, there came in a man of stately look, in the attire of a shepherd, cloaked in a white skin, and having a script on his shoulders, and a staff in his hand. And he saluted me, and I saluted him back. And immediately he sat down beside me, and said to me, I was sent by the most revered angel to dwell with thee the rest of thy days. Thinking that he was come to try me, I said to him, But who art thou? For I know, quoth I, to whom I was delivered. He said unto me, Knowest thou me not? Nay, quoth I. I, quoth he, am the shepherd to whom thou wast delivered. While he yet spake, his visage was changed, and I took knowledge of him, that it was he to whom I had been delivered. And immediately I was confounded, and fear took hold upon me, and I was quite overcome with grief at having so answered him wickedly and foolishly. Then he answered and said to me, Be not confounded, but strengthen thyself in my commandments, which I am about to command thee. For I was sent, quoth he, to show thee again all that thou sawest before, to wit the sum of the things expedient for thee. First of all, write thou my commandments and parables, and the rest, as I will show thee. So shalt thou write. For this cause, quoth he, I bid thee first write the commandments and parables, that thou mayest read them oft, and be able to keep them. So I wrote the commandments and parables, as he commanded me. 
If therefore, when ye have heard them, ye keep them, and walk in them, and do them with a pure heart, ye shall receive from the Lord what things he promised you. But if when ye hear, ye repent not, but add yet to your sins, ye shall receive from him the contrary. All these things the shepherd, the angel of repentance, commanded me thus to write. End of Visions 4 and 5「The Mandates » of « Shepherd of Hermas » by Hermas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Mandate First of all, believe that there is one God, the Creator and Framer of all things, who made all things to be out of that which was not, and comprehendeth all things, and is alone incomprehensible. Believe therefore in Him, and fear Him, and fearing him be continent. These things observe, and thou shalt cast away all wickedness from thee, and thou shalt put on every virtue of righteousness, and shall live unto God, if thou keep this commandment. Second Mandate He said to me, Hold to simplicity, and be without guile, and thou shalt be as little children which know not the wickedness that destroyeth the life of men. First speak evil of no man, either hearken gladly to one that speaketh evil. Else thou also that hearkenest shalt be guilty of the sin of him that speaketh the evil. If so be thou believe the slander which thou hearest. For if thou believe it, thou wilt thyself also have somewhat against thy brother. So shalt thou be guilty of the sin of the slander. Slander is mischievous, it is an unruly devil, never at peace, but always dwelling in dissensions. Keep thyself therefore from it, and thou shalt be in harmony always with all men, and put on reverence, wherein is no evil offense, but all is plain and pleasant. Work the thing that is good, and of thy labors which God giveth thee, give liberally to all that need, not doubting, to whom thou should givest, or not give. Give to all, for God would have us give to all out of his own gifts. They therefore who receive shall give an account to God, whereof they received and to what end. For such as receive, because they are straitened, shall not be brought into judgment. But they who receive in hypocrisy shall pay the price. So then the giver is guiltless, for as he had it from the Lord to perform the ministry, so he performed it in simplicity, making no distinction to whom to give or not give. Such service performed simply is honorable with God. He therefore who thus ministereth simply shall live unto God. Keep then this commandment, as I have said unto thee, that thou and thy house may be found sincere in your repentance and thy heart pure and undefiled. Third Mandate Again he said unto me, Love truth, and let all be truth which proceedeth out of thy mouth, that the Spirit which God made to dwell in this flesh may be found true with all men. And so the Lord who dwelleth in thee shall be glorified. For the Lord is true in every word, and with him is no lie. They therefore who lie deny the Lord and become robbers of the Lord, not yielding up to him the deposit which they received. For they received from him a spirit void of falseness. If they return this falsified, they have defiled the commandment of the Lord and become robbers. Now when I heard these things, I wept bitterly, and seeing me weep, he said, Why weepest thou? Because, sir, quoth I, I know not whether I can be saved. Wherefore, quoth he, Because, sir, quoth I, never yet in my life spake I a true word, but I lived always knavishly with all men, and displayed my falsehood as truth to all. Nor did any one ever gainsay me, but my word was believed. How then, sir, quoth I, can I live when I have done these things? Thou thinkest well and truly, quoth he, for it were fit that thou, as a servant of God, shouldest walk in truth, 
and that an evil conscience should not dwell with the spirit of truth, nor bring grief upon the reverent and true spirit. Never before, sir, quoth I, did I hear such words aright. Now therefore, that thou hearest, quoth he, keep them, to the end that even those things which thou spakest falsely in thy business may become trusty, now that this is found true, for even those may become trusty, if thou keep these things, and from henceforth speak all truth, thou shalt be able to gain life for thyself. And whoso shall hear this commandment, and keep himself from that most wicked thing, falsehood, shall live unto God. Fourth Mandate Chapter 1 I charge thee, quoth he, to observe purity, and to let no thought about another man's wife, or about any fornication, or the likeness of any such evil things, enter thy heart. For by doing this thou committest great sin. Whereas if thou remember always thine own wife, thou shalt never fall into sin. But if this imagination enter thy heart, thou wilt fall into sin. Or should other like evil thought, thou committest sin. For this imagination is great sin to a servant of God. And if one do this evil thing, he worketh death to himself. See therefore that thou keep thyself from this thought. For where modesty dwelleth, their iniquity should not come into the heart of a righteous man. I said to him, Sir, suffer me to ask thee a few things. Say on, quoth he. Sir, quoth I, if one have a wife that is faithful in the Lord, and he find her in some adultery, doth then the husband sin if he live with her? During ignorance, quoth he, he sinneth not. But if the man come to know of her sin, and the wife repent not, but continue in her fornication, and the man live with her, he becometh guilty of her sin, and a partner in her adultery. What then, sir, quoth I, should the man do, if the woman continue in this passion? Let him put her away, quoth he, and let the husband abide alone. But if when he hath put away his wife, he marry another, then he likewise committeth adultery. But if, sir, quoth I, after the wife hath been put away, she repent, and desire to return to her own husband, shall she not be received? Yea, verily, quoth he, if the husband receive her not, he sinneth, and bringeth great sin upon himself. He that has sinned and repenteth must be received, yet not often, for to the servants of God there is but one repentance. For the sake of her repentance, therefore, the husband ought not to marry. Thus the case standeth with both wife and husband. And not only, quoth he, is it adultery if a man defile his flesh, but whoso doth things after the similitude of the heathen, likewise committeth adultery. So then, if a man continue in such deeds and repent not, refrain from him, and company not with him. Otherwise, thou also art a partaker of his sin. For this cause ye are bidden to abide alone, whether husband or wife, for in such matters there may be repentance. Now hereby, quoth he, I give not occasion that this thing should be consummated, but that he who hath sinned may sin no more. As for his former sin, there is one who can give healing, for it is he that hath the power over all things. Chapter 2 I asked him again, saying, Since the Lord counted me worthy, that thou shouldest always dwell with me, bear with yet a few words from me, for I understand nothing, and my heart is grown dull from my former doings. Give me understanding, for I am very foolish, and apprehend nothing at all. He answered and said to me, I am set over repentance, and to all who repent I give understanding. Seemeth it not to thee that this very repenting is understanding? To repent, quoth he, is great understanding. For he that sinned then understandeth that he hath done what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And the deed that he hath committed cometh into his mind, and he repenteth and no longer worketh evil, but worketh good lavishly. 
and humbleth and tormenteth his own soul because he sinned. Thou seest, therefore, that repentance is great understanding. For this cause, sir, quoth I, do I inquire diligently of thee about all things. Because first I am a sinner, and then I know not what things I should do that I may live. For my sins are many in number and manifold. Thou shalt live, quoth he, if thou keep my commandments and walk in them. And whosoever heareth these commandments and keepeth them shall live unto God. Chapter 3 I will ask yet something more, sir, quoth I. Say on, quoth he. I have heard, sir, quoth I, from certain teachers, that there is no other repentance than that one, when we went down into the water and received remission of our former sins. He said to me, Thou didst rightly hear, for so it is. He who hath received remission of sins must sin no more, but dwell in purity. Howbeit, seeing thou inquirest diligently about all things, I will show thee this also, not as giving occasion to such as are about to believe, or have now believed on the Lord, for they who have now believed are about to believe have no more repentance from their sins, but have only remission of their former sins. For them that were called before these days the Lord appointed repentance, because the Lord, knowing the hearts and foreknowing all things, knew the weakness of men and the cunning craftiness of the devil, how that he would do the servants of God some hurt and deal wickedly with them. The Lord, therefore, being full of compassion, had compassion upon his handiwork, and appointed this repentance. And to me was given the power over this repentance. But I say unto thee, quoth he, that after that great and solemn calling, should any man, being sorely tempted of the devil's sin, he hath one repentance. But if he sin oft, and repent, it advantage not such an one, for hardly shall he live. I said to him, I was quickened when I heard these things, from thee thus perfectly. For I know that, if from henceforth I add no more to my sins, I shall be saved. Thou shalt be saved, quoth he, and so shall all who do these things. Chapter 4 I asked him again, saying, Sir, seeing thou bearest with me thus far, show me further this also. Say on, quoth he. If, sir, quoth I, a wife, or again a husband, fall on sleep, and the other marry, doth he that marrieth commit sin? He sinneth not, quoth he, but if one abide alone, he winneth for himself more exceeding honor, and great glory before the Lord. But if he marry, he sinneth not. Do thou, therefore, maintain pureness and modesty, and thou shalt live unto God. All these things which I say, I say unto thee, observe henceforth. From the day thou wast delivered unto me, I will dwell in thy house, and thou shalt have forgiveness of thy former transgressions, if thou keep my commandments. Yea, and all shall have forgiveness, if they keep these my commandments, and walk in this purity. Fifth Mandate Chapter 1 Be long-suffering and prudent, quoth he, and thou shalt have dominion over all wicked works, and shalt do all righteousness. For if thou be long-suffering, the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in thee shall be clear and not darkened over by another evil spirit. But dwelling at large shall joy and rejoice with the vessel in which it dwelleth, and shall serve God with much gladness, having harmony within itself. But if any ill temper approach, immediately the Holy Spirit, which is delicate, is straitened by not having clear space, and seeketh to depart from the place. For it is choked by the evil spirit, and hath not room to serve the Lord as it would, because it is foul-mouthed by the ill-temper. For the Lord dwelleth in forbearance, but the devil in passionness. That both the spirits then should dwell together is unprofitable and evil for the man in whom they dwell. For if thou take and pour a little wormwood into a jar of honey, is not all the honey marred, and so much honey spoilt by that very little wormwood, 
which destroyeth the sweetness of the honey, so that it no longer hath the same flavor with its owner, because it is soured and hath lost its use. But if the wormwood be not dropped into the honey, the honey is found sweet, and is fit for its master's use. Thou seest then that patience is even sweeter than honey, and is useful to the Lord, and wherein he dwelleth. But impatience is bitter and useless. If then impatience be mingled with patience, the patience is corrupted, and the man's prayer is useless to God. I would know, sir, quoth I, the working of quick temper, that I may keep myself from it. Assuredly, quoth he, except thou and thy house keep thyself therefrom, thou hast lost all thy hope. But keep thee from it, for I am with thee. Yea, and all such as repent with their whole heart shall refrain from it. For I will be with them, and will preserve them, seeing they were all justified by the most reverent angel. Chapter 2 Hear now, quoth he, the working of quick temper, how evil it is, and how it trippeth up the servants of God by its operation, and how it seduceth them from righteousness. Howbeit it seduceth them not that are full in the faith, neither can it take effect upon them, because the power of the Lord is with them. But it seduceth the empty and double-minded, for when it seeth such men tranquil, it creepeth privily into the heart of a man, and for no cause at all the man or the woman is in bitterness because of the things of life, whether about meats or some pettiness, or about a friend, or about giving and receiving, or such like silly things. For all these things are silly and vain, and foolish and unprofitable to the servants of God. But long-suffering is great and strong, hath mighty and firm power, and thriveth in great enlargement, is joyous, exalting, void of care, and glorified the Lord in all seasons. And it hath in itself no bitterness, but abideth continually meek and quiet. This long-suffering dwelleth with them whose faith is whole, but quick temper is first silly and light and foolish. Then of folly is bred bitterness, and of bitterness anger, and of anger wrath, and of wrath fury. Then fury, being compounded of these many evils, groweth to great and incurable sin. For when all these spirits dwell in one vessel, where also the Holy Spirit dwelleth, that vessel holdeth them not but runneth over. The delicate spirit then, not being used to dwell with an evil spirit, nor with violence, withdraweth from such a man, and seeketh to dwell with meekness and quietness. Then, when it is departed from the man in whom it dwelt, that man is emptied of the righteous spirit, and being filled thenceforth with the evil spirits, he is unstable in all his doing, being drawn to and fro by the evil spirits, and is quite blind in his sense of that which is good. Thus it happeneth to all who are quick-tempered. Keep thyself then from quick-temper, that most evil spirits, and put on long-suffering, and resist impatience and bitterness, and thou shalt be found in fellowship with the reverence which is beloved of the Lord. See that thou never neglect this commandment, for if thou have the mastery of this commandment, thou shalt be able also to keep the rest of the commandments which I shall command thee. Confirm and strengthen thyself in them, and let all strengthen themselves who would walk in them. Sixth Mandate, Chapter 1 I charge thee, quoth he, in the first commandment, to keep faith and fear and continence. Yea, sir, quoth I, but now, quoth he, I would show thee their powers also, that thou mayest understand what power and effect each of them hath, because their workings are twofold, for they relate to things righteous and unrighteous. Do thou then believe in what is righteous, and put no faith in the unrighteous. For the way of the righteous is straight, and the way of the unrighteous crooked. Walk thou in the straight and even way, and leave the crooked way. For the crooked way hath not paths but no ways, and many stumbling blocks, and it is rough and thorny. Therefore it is hurtful to them that go in it. 
but they who go by the straight way walk evenly and without offense, for it is neither rough nor thorny. Thou seest then that it is more expedient to walk in this way. It liketh me, sir, quoth I, to walk in this way. Thou shalt walk in it, quoth he, and whoso turneth with all his heart to the Lord shall walk therein. Chapter 2 Hear now, quoth he, about faith. There are two angels with a man, one of righteous and the other of wickedness. How then, sir, quoth I, shall I know their operations, seeing that both angels dwell with me? Hearken, quoth he, and understand them. The angel of righteousness is delicate and shamefast, and meek and quiet. When therefore he cometh into thy heart, immediately he talketh with thee of righteousness, of pureness, of modesty, of contentment, of every just work and every honorable virtue. When all these things come into thy heart, know that the angel of righteousness is with thee. These are the works of the angel of righteousness. Have faith therefore in him and his works. Now see also the works of the angel of wickedness. First of all, he is angry and bitter and foolish, and his works are evil and overturn the servants of God. When this one therefore cometh into thy heart, know him from his works. Sir, quoth I, how may I know him I understand not? Hearken, quoth he, when any anger or bitterness come upon thee, know that he is in thee. Then, when a longing after many doings, and costly excessive meats, and strong drinks, and frequent revilings, and all manner of luxuries and unnecessary things, and the desire of women, and covetousness, and pride and boasting, and such things as are akin and like to these, whensoever these things come into thy heart, know that the angel of wickedness is with thee. Do thou therefore take advantage of his works, and withdraw from him, and put no trust in him, because his works are evil and inexpedient for the servants of God. Thou hast then the operations of both angels. Understand them, and have faith in the angel of righteousness, and withdraw from the angel of wickedness, because his teaching is evil in every work. For though a man be faithful, yet if the thought of this angel come into his heart, that man or woman must needs fall into some sin. Contrarywise, be a man or woman ever so wicked, if the works of the angel of righteousness come into their heart, of necessity they must do something good. Thou seest then, quoth he, that it is good to follow the angel of righteousness, and to take leave of the angel of wickedness. This commandment showeth the things concerning faith, to the end that thou mayest believe the works of the angel of righteousness, and doing them mayest live unto God, and believe that the works of the angel of wickedness are grievous, and so by not doing them thou shalt live unto God. Seventh Mandate Fear the Lord, quoth he, and keep his commandments, and while thou keepest the commandments of God, thou shalt be able in all that thou doest, and thy doing shall be beyond compare. For fearing the Lord, thou shalt do all things well. This is the fear which thou must fear, that so thou mayest be saved. But fear not the devil, for if thou fear the Lord, thou shalt have dominion over the devil, because there is no power in him. There is no fear of one who hath no power in him. But if one have glorious power, there is also fear of him. For whoso hath power hath fear, but he that hath not power is despised of all. Nevertheless, fear the works of the devil, because they are evil. For fear of the Lord, then, thou shalt fear the works of the devil, and not do them, but refrain from them. There are therefore two kinds of fear. If thou be minded to do evil, Fear the Lord, and thou shalt not do it. Or if again thou be minded to do good, fear the Lord, and thou shalt do it. So then, the fear of the Lord is strong and great and glorious. Fear the Lord, therefore, and thou shalt live unto him, and all who keep his commandments and fear him shall live unto God. Wherefore, sir, quoth I, 
sayest thou concerning them that observe his commandments, they shall live unto God? Because, quoth he, the whole creation feareth the Lord, but doth not keep his commandments, such as both fear him and keep his commandments, to them belong the life with God. But they that keep not his commandments, neither have they life in him. Eighth Mandate I told thee, quoth he, that the creatures of God are twofold, for even temperance is twofold, because in some things a man ought to be temperate, but in some he ought not. Acquaint me, sir, quoth I, in what things it is it right to be temperate, and in what things not. Hearken, quoth he, be temperate in evil, and do it not, and in good be not temperate, but do it. For if thou be temperate, and do not good, thou committest great sin. But if thou be temperate, and do not evil, thou workest great righteousness. Wherefore abstain from all wickedness, and do good. Of what sort, sir, quoth I, are the wickednesses from which we must abstain? Here, quoth he, from adultery, from fornication, from lawless drunkenness, from evil luxury, from many meats, and lavish expense, and vaunting, and arrogance, and haughtiness, and from falsehood, and slander, and hypocrisy, and remembrance of wrong, and all blasphemy. These deeds are the most evil of all in the life of men. From these deeds, therefore, the servant of God must abstain. For he who doth not contain himself from all these cannot live unto God. Hear, therefore, the things subsequent upon these. What, sir, quoth I, are there yet other evil deeds? Yea, many there be, quoth he, from which the servant of God must abstain. Theft, lying, fraud, false witness, covetousness, evil concupiscence, deceit, vainglory, boastfulness, and all such things as are like unto these. Thinkest thou not that these things are evil? Yea, very evil, quoth he, for the servants of God. From all these he that serveth God must abstain. Abstain therefore from all these, that thou mayest live unto God, and be inscribed with them that abstain therefrom. These then are the things from which it behoveth thee to abstain. Here also, quoth he, the things thou shouldest not abstain from, but do them. Abstain not from good, but do it. Sir, quoth I, show me also the power of good things, that I may walk in them and serve them, to the end that in doing them I may be able to be saved. Here, quoth he, the works of goodness also, which thou must do and not abstain from. First of all, faith. Fear of the Lord, love, concord, words of righteousness, truth, patience. There is nothing better than these in the life of men. If a man keep these and abstain not from them, he shall be happy in his life. Next hear the things subsequent upon these. To minister to widows, to visit orphans and the needy, to redeem the servants of God from necessities, to love hospitality, for in hospitality may haply be found well-doing, to be opposed to no man, to be quiet, to make thyself poorer than all men, to reverence the aged, to practice righteousness, to preserve brotherhood, to endure despite, to be long-suffering, not to have remembrance of wrong, to comfort the weary in soul, not to cast away them that have stumbled from the faith, but to convert and cheer them, to admonish sinners, not to oppress poor debtors, and if there be any other things like unto these. Seem these things to thee, quoth he, to be good. Yea, for what, sir, quoth I, what can be better than these? Walk then, quoth he, in them, and abstain not from them, and thou shalt live unto God. Keep therefore this commandment. If thou do good, and abstain not from it, thou shalt live unto God. And all shall live unto God who do so. And again, if thou do not evil, but abstain from it, thou shalt live unto God. And they shall all live unto God who keep these commandments and walk in them. Ninth Mandate He said to me, Put away from thee double-mindedness, and doubt not to ask anything at all from God. 
saying within thyself, How can I ask and receive anything from the Lord, who have so greatly sinned against him? Reason not thus with thyself, but with all thy heart turn to the Lord, and ask of him without doubting, and thou shalt know his much compassion, how that he will not forsake thee, but will fulfill the request of thy soul. For God is not as men who bear malice, but he remembereth not wrong and pitieth his handiwork. Do thou therefore cleanse thy heart from all the vanities of this world, and the things before spoken of to thee, and ask of the Lord, and thou shalt receive all things, and shalt not be disappointed of any of thy requests, if thou ask of the Lord without doubting. But if thou doubt in thy heart, thou shalt surely not receive any of thy requests. For they who doubt toward God, these are the double-minded, and they obtain nothing at all of their petitions. But such as are whole in the faith, ask all things trusting on the Lord, and they receive because they ask confidently nothing doubting. For every man of doubtful mind, except he repent, shall hardly be saved. Cleanse therefore thy heart from doubtfulness, and put on faith, for she is strong, and trust God that thou shalt receive all thy petitions which thou askest. And if at any time, when thou hast made a request of the Lord, thou shalt receive it somewhat slowly, doubt not, because thou didst not receive the request of thy soul speedily. For it is surely because of some temptation, or some trespass, which thou art not aware, of that thou receivest thy request the more slowly. Do thou therefore cease not to make the request of thy soul, and thou shalt receive it. But if thou faint and be of doubtful mind, when thou askest, blame thyself and not him that giveth unto thee. Mark this double-mindedness, for it is evil and without understanding, and rooteth up many from the faith, though they be very faithful and strong. For this double-mindedness is a daughter of the devil, and dealeth very wickedly with the servants of God. Therefore despise it, and have dominion over it in all things, putting on faith which is strong and mighty. For faith promiseth all things, perfecteth all things. But double-mindedness, mistrusting herself, faileth in all her works which she enterpriseth. Thou seest then, quoth he, that faith is from above, from the Lord, and hath great power. But double-mindedness is an earthly spirit from the devil, and hath no power. Do thou therefore serve faith which hath power, and keep thyself from doubt which hath no power, and thou shalt live unto God, and all shall live unto God who are thus minded. Tenth Mandate Put away sorrow from thee, quoth he, for she is a sister of double-mindedness, and quick temper. How, sir, quoth I, can she be sister to these? For quick temper seemeth to me to be one thing, and double-mindedness another, and sorrow another. Thou art a foolish fellow, quoth he. Perceivest thou not that sorrow is worse than all the spirits, and most dreadful to the servants of God, and corrupteth a man more than all the spirits, and weareth out the Holy Spirit, and again saveth. Sir, quoth I, I am foolish, and understand not these parables. For how can it wear out, and again save? I perceive not. Here, quoth he, they who never searched about the truth, nor inquired diligently concerning the things of God, but believed only, and were mixed up with business and wealth, and heathen friendships, and many other affairs of this world, such, I say, as are intent upon these things, understand not the parables of divinity, for they are darkened by these employments, and they decay and grow barren. Even as goodly vineyards, when they meet with neglect, are made barren by thorns and all manner of weeds. So do men, who after they have believed, fall into these many doings, before said, wander from their mind, and apprehend nothing at all about righteousness. For when they hear the things of God in truth, their mind is sunk in their business, and they understand nothing at all. But they who have fear of God, and search about divinity and truth, 
have their heart set unto the Lord, do more quickly perceive and understand all the things said to them, because they have the fear of the Lord within them. For where the Lord dwelleth, there is also much understanding. Cleave therefore unto the Lord, and thou shalt understand and apprehend all things. Chapter 2 Hear now, quoth he, O foolish man, how sorrow weareth out the Holy Spirit, and again saveth. When the double-minded man setteth himself to any business, and faileth in it because of his double-mindedness, this same sorrow entereth into the man, and grieveth and weareth out the Holy Spirit. Then again, whenever quick temper hath joined itself to a man in respect of some matter, he is in some bitterness. Again sorrow entereth into the heart of the man that was angered, and he is grieved at his deed which he did, and repenteth at having wrought evil. This sorrow then seemeth to have salvation, because when he had done evil he repented. Both behaviors therefore grieve the spirit, doubting, because it had not good success in its doing, and anger likewise because it wrought evil. Both are grievous to the spirit of God, double-mindedness and passionateness. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and afflict not the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in thee, lest it make intercession against thee with God, and depart from thee. For the Spirit of God, which was given to be in this flesh, beareth neither sorrow nor straightness. Chapter 3 Put on joy, therefore, which always hath favor with God, and is acceptable to him, and delight thou in her. For every joyful man worketh good things, and mindeth good things, and despiseth sorrow. But the sorrowful man always does wickedly. For he doeth wickedly, because he grieveth the Holy Spirit, which, when it was given to man, was joyful. And secondarily, in grieving the Holy Spirit, he worketh iniquity, neither praying nor making confession to God. For the power of a sorrowful man hath never power to ascend to the altar of God. Wherefore, quoth I, doth the prayer of one who is sorrowful not ascend to the altar? Because, quoth he, sorrow coucheth in his heart, which sorrow then, being mingled with his intercession, suffereth it not to go up pure to the altar. For as wine, when vinegar is mixed with it, hath not the same pleasantness, so likewise, when sorrow is mixed with the Holy Spirit, it hath not the same power of intercession. Cleanse thyself, therefore, from this evil sorrow, and thou shalt live unto God. And all shall live unto God, as many as put away sadness from them, and put on all joyfulness. Eleventh Mandate Chapter 1 He showed me men sitting on a bench, and another man sitting on a chair. And he said to me, Seest thou them that sit on the bench? I see them, sir, quoth I. These, quoth he, are faithful, but he that sitteth on the chair is a false prophet, who destroyeth the sense of the servants of God, to wit, of the double-minded, but not of the faithful. These men of two minds then come to him as a soothsayer, and ask him what haply shall befall them and the false prophet, having in himself no power of the divine spirit. Answereth them according to their demands, and according to their unholy desires, and filleth their souls even as they wish. For being himself void, he giveth void answers to the void. Because whatsoever he be asked, he answereth according to the emptiness of the man. Yet he speaketh some true words also, for the devil filleth him with his spirit, that peradventure he may be able to break some one of the righteous. As many, therefore, as have put on the truth, and are strong in the faith of the Lord, cleave not to such spirits, but keep away from them. But men who are of two minds, and often repent, use divination like the heathen, and bring upon themselves the greater sin by their idolatry. For he that inquireth of a false prophet about any matter is an idolater, and void of the truth, and foolish. For any spirit given of God is not inquired of, but having the power of the Godhead, it speaketh all things of itself, because it is from above, 
from the power of the divine spirit. But the spirit that is inquired of and speaketh according to the desires of men is earthly and light and hath no power, and it speaketh not all except it be inquired of. How then, sir, quoth I, shall a man know which of them is a prophet and which is a false prophet? Here, quoth he, concerning both the prophets, and as I will now tell thee, so shalt thou prove the prophet and the false prophet. From his life prove thou the man that hath the divine spirit. First, he that hath the divine spirit, which is from above, is meek and peaceable and lowly, and refraineth himself from every wickedness and vain desire of this world. And he that maketh himself more needy than all men, and answereth nothing to any when inquired of, and speaketh not solitary, neither when a man would speak doth the Holy Spirit speak, but when God willeth that he should speak, then he speaketh. Whensoever, therefore, the man who hath the divine spirit cometh into a synagogue of just men, who have faith in the divine spirit, and the congregation of those men make their prayer unto God, then the angel of the prophetic spirit, which besetteth him, filleth the man, and the man being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaketh to the multitude as the Lord willeth. Thus then shall the Spirit of the Godhead be manifest. Concerning the divine Spirit of the Lord, such is its power. Hear now, quoth he, about the Spirit that is earthly, and void, and hath no power, but is foolish. First, the man who thinketh that he hath the Spirit exalteth himself, and wisheth to have the preeminence. And straightway he is heady and shameless, and full of talk, and conversant among many luxuries and other deceits. And he receiveth hire for his prophecy, and if he receive not, he prophesieth not. Can then a divine spirit receive hire and prophecy? It cannot be that a prophet of God should do this, but the spirit of such prophets is earthly. And then he never at all approacheth an assembly of righteous men, but fleeth from them. And he joineth himself to the double-minded and empty, and prophesieth unto them in corners, and deceiveth them by speaking in all things emptily according to their lusts. For it is to the empty that he replieth, because an empty vessel set with empty ones is not crushed, but they agree one with another. When, however, he cometh to a full assembly of just men who have the divine spirit, and intercession is made by them, that man is emptied, and the earthly spirit fleeth away from him for fear, and the man is struck dumb and utterly crushed, not being able to speak a word. For if thou pack jars of wine or oil in a cellar, and put an empty jar among them, and afterwards wish to unpack the cellar, the jar which was put away empty will be found still empty. And so the empty prophets, when they come to the spirits of just men, are found such as they came. Thou hast now the life of both prophets. From his life and works, then, prove the man who saith that he is possessed of the Spirit, and believe thou the Spirit that cometh from God and hath power, and put no trust in the earthly and void Spirit, because there is no power in it, for it cometh from the devil. Hear this parable which I will speak unto thee, Take and throw a stone at the heaven, and see if thou canst touch it. Or again, take a siphon of water, and spout it at heaven, and see if thou canst bore the heaven. How, sir, quoth I, can these things be? For both these things thou hast spoken are impossible. As then, quoth he, these things are impossible, so earthly spirits are unable and impotent. Take now the power that cometh from above. Hail is a very small grain, and when it falleth upon a man's head, what pain it giveth. Or again, take the drops that fall upon the ground from the tiling, and bore the stone. Thou seest then that the smallest things falling from above to earth have great power. Even so, the divine spirit coming from above is powerful. Believe therefore this spirit, and from the other refrain. Twelfth Mandate, Chapter 1 He said to me, 
put away from thee every evil desire and put on the good and holy desire for having put on this desire thou shalt hate the evil desire and shall curb it as thou wilt for the evil desire is fierce and hard to tame for it is fearful and by its fierceness it wasteth men exceedingly especially if a servant of god fall into it and be not prudent he is wasted by it terribly and it wasteth such as have not the garment of a good desire but are entangled in this world these it delivereth unto death of what kind sir quoth i are the works of the evil desire which deliver men over unto death acquaint me that i may refrain from them here quoth he by what works the evil desire slayeth the servants of god chapter two foremost of all is the desire for another's wife or husband and for much outlay of wealth and for diverse vain meats and strong drinks and many other foolish luxuries for all luxury is foolish and vain to the servants of god these desires then are evil and slay the servants of god for this evil desire is daughter to the devil ye ought therefore to refrain from evil desires that by refraining ye may live unto god but as many are overmastered by them and withstand them not perish utterly for these desires are deadly but do thou put on the desire of righteousness and being fully armed with the fear of the lord withstand them for the fear of the lord dwelleth in the good desire the evil desire if she see thee armed in the fear of god and withstanding her will flee far from thee and no more be seen of thee being in fear of thy arms do thou then when thou hast triumphed over her come to the desire of righteousness and yielding up to her the victory thou hast won serve her even as she willeth if thou serve the good desire and be subject to her thou shalt be able to have dominion over the evil desire and to subdue her even as thou wilt chapter three i would know sir quoth i by what behavior i must serve the good desire here quoth he work righteousness and virtue truth and fear of the lord faith and meekness and whatsoever good things are like unto these if thou do these things thou shalt be a well-pleasing servant of god and shalt live unto him and every one who serveth good desire shall live unto god so he made an end of the twelve commandments and said unto me thou hast these commandments walk therein and exhort them that hear that their repentance may be pure the rest of the days of their life do thy diligence to accomplish this ministry which i give thee and thou shalt do much for thou shalt find favor with those who are about to repent and they shall be persuaded by thy words for i will be with thee and will constrain them to obey thee i said to him sir these commandments are great and fair and glorious and able to rejoice the heart of the man who can observe them but i wot not if these commandments can be kept by a man because they are exceeding hard he answered and said to me if thou put it to thyself that they can be kept thou shalt keep them easily and they will not be hard but if it enter thy heart that they cannot be kept by a man thou wilt not keep them now therefore i say unto thee if thou keep them not but neglect them thou shalt not have salvation neither thy children nor thy house since thou hast already judged for thyself that these commandments cannot be kept by a man chapter four these things he said to me very wrathfully so that i was confounded and in great fear of him for his form was changed so that a man could not bear his wrath but seeing me all troubled and put to confusion he began to speak to me more gently and pleasantly and said o foolish unwise and double-minded man perceivest thou not the glory of god how great and strong and marvellous it is for he created the world for the sake of man and put all his creation in subjection to man and gave him all authority to rule over all things under heaven if then quoth he man is lord of the creatures of god and hath dominion over them all 
can he not have dominion over these commandments also? The man, quoth he, who hath the Lord in his heart, is able to have dominion over all things, and all these commandments. But they who have the Lord on their lips, and their heart hardened, and who are far from the Lord, to them these commandments are difficult and hard to walk in. Set ye therefore the Lord in your hearts, ye that are empty and light in the faith, and ye shall know that there is nothing easier nor sweeter nor gentler than these commandments. Turn again ye that walk in the commandments of the devil, that are so hard and bitter and wild and wanton, and fear not the devil, because in him there is no power against you. For I, the angel of repentance, who have dominion over him, will be with you. The devil hath only fear, and his fear hath no force. Fear him not, therefore, and he shall flee from you. Chapter 5 I said to him, Sir, hear a few words from me. Say, quoth he, what thou desirest. Man, sir, quoth I, is zealous to keep the commandments of God, and there is none that prayeth not of the Lord to be made strengthened in his commandments, and made obedient to them. But the devil is strong and overpowereth them. He is not able, quoth he, to overpower the servants of God, who hope on him with all their heart. The devil can wrestle with them, but cannot overthrow them. If therefore ye withstand him, he shall be conquered, and flee from you ashamed. But such as are empty, quoth he, fear the devil, as if he had power. When a man hath filled a great plenty of jars with good wine, and among those jars are a few somewhat empty, he cometh to the jars, and looketh not at the full ones, for he knoweth that they are full. But he looketh at the empty ones, for fear they should have turned sour. For jars that are not full soon turn sour, and the sweet savor of the wine is lost. Even so the devil cometh to all the servants of God, making trial of them. Such then as are full in the faith resist him stoutly, and he departeth from them, finding no place to enter. Then he cometh to the empty ones, and finding room he entereth into them, and he worketh in them what he desireth, and they become bondmen unto him. Chapter 6 But I, the angel of repentance, say unto you, Fear not the devil, for I was sent, quoth he, to be with such of you as repent with their whole heart, and to make them strong in the faith. Trust God, therefore, ye that have despaired of your life, and added to your sins, and are weighing down your life, that if ye turn to the Lord with all your heart, and do righteousness the rest of the days of your life, and serve him rightly according to his will, he will heal your former sins, and ye shall have power to have dominion over the works of the devil. And fear not at all the threatening of the devil, for he is slack like the sinews of a corpse. Hearken to me, therefore, and fear him who is all able to save and to destroy, and observe these commandments, and ye shall live unto God. I said to him, Sir, now I am strengthened in all the ordinances of the Lord, because thou art with me, and I know that thou wilt break all the power of the devil, and we shall have dominion over him and prevail over all his works. I hope, sir, that I am able now to keep these commandments which thou hast commanded, the Lord enabling me. Thou shalt keep them, quoth he, if thy heart be pure unto the Lord and all who cleanse their hearts from the vain desires of this world shall keep them, and they shall live unto God. End of the Mandates Similitude 1 through 5 of Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Similitudes First Similitude he said to me, Ye know, ye who are God's servant, that ye are dwelling in a strange land, for your city is far off from the city. If then ye know your city in which ye are to dwell, why prepare ye here fields and costly arrays, and buildings and vain habitations? He who prepareth 
of these things, for this city thinketh not of returning to his own city. O foolish and double-minded and wretched man, considerest thou not that all these things are alien and under the power of another? For the Lord of this city shall say, I will not that thou shouldest dwell in my city. Depart from the city, because thou observest not my laws. Thou then, having fields and dwellings and many other possessions, when thou art banished by him, what will thou do with thy land and thine house and all the rest which thou hast prepared for thyself? For rightly saith the Lord of this country unto thee, Either use my laws, or get thee out of my country. Thou then, what wilt thou do, seeing thou hast a law in thine own city? For the sake of thy fields and other substance, wilt thou utterly deny thy law, and walk by the law of this city? See if it is not unprofitable for thee to deny thy law. For if thou then desire to return to thy city, thou shalt surely not be received, because thou hast denied the law of thy city, but shalt be shut out from it. Take heed, therefore, and, as one that dwelleth in a strange land, provide no more for thyself than the competency which sufficeth thee, and be ready, whensoever the master of this city shall choose to cast thee out for resisting his law to leave his city and depart to thy city, and use thine own law, not as suffering wrong, but rejoicing. Take heed, ye that serve God, and have him in your heart. Work the works of God, remembering his commandments and the promises which he promised, and believe that he will perform them if his commandments be kept. Instead of fields, therefore, purchase souls that are afflicted, according as each one is able and visit widows and orphans, and neglect them not. On such fields and houses freely spend your wealth, and all your ray which ye have received from God. For thereunto did the Master enrich you, that you might fulfill these ministrations unto him. Far better is it to buy such lands and possessions and houses as thou shalt find in thy city when thou goest home to it. This expensefulness is pleasant and fair, and bringeth not sorrow nor fear, but joy. Practice not, then, the expensefulness of the heathen, for it is inexpedient for you that are God's servants. But practice your proper expensefulness, wherein ye may rejoice, and counterfeit not, neither touch that which is another man's, nor desire it. For it is an evil thing to desire the goods of others but do thine own work, and thou shalt be saved. Second Similitude As I was walking into the country, and looking at an elm and a vine, and discerning between them and between their fruits, the shepherd was manifested unto me, and said, What questionest thou within thyself? I am considering, sir, quoth I, about the elm and the vine, how that they are most goodly for one another. These two trees, quoth he, are set for a figure to the servants of God. I would know, sir, quoth I, the figure of these trees whereof thou speakest. Seest thou, quoth he, the elm and the vine? I see them, sir, quoth I. This vine, quoth he, beareth fruit, but the elm is an unfruitful tree. Yet the vine, except to climb up the elm, cannot bear much fruit because it is cast upon the ground, and what fruit it beareth is decayed, if it hang not upon the elm. But when the vine is spread upon the elm, it beareth fruit, both of itself and from the elm. Thou seest then that the elm likewise yieldeth much fruit, not less than the vine, but rather more. How more, sir, quoth I? Because, quoth he, the vine hanging upon the elm yieldeth much and good fruit. But when it is spread upon the ground, what it beareth is corrupt and scant. This parable concerneth the servants of God, to wit, the rich and the poor. How, sir, quoth I, acquaint me. Hearken, quoth he, the rich hath much wealth, 
but in things concerning the Lord he is poor, because he is distraught about his riches. And he hath very little of confession and intercession with the Lord. And what he hath is small and faint and without power above. When, therefore, the rich ascendeth upon the poor and supplieth his needs, believing that for what he doeth, for the poor he shall be able to find his reward with God, because the poor is rich in intercession, and his intercession hath great power with God. Then the rich bountifully supplieth the poor, with all things nothing doubting, and the poor being provided for by the rich intercedeth for him, thanking God for him that gave to him. And he becometh yet more diligent about the poor, that he may be without fail in his life. For he knoweth that the intercession of the poor is acceptable and rich unto God. Both then fulfill their work. The poor maketh the intercession, wherein he is rich, which he received from the Lord. With this he repayeth him that provideth for him. And the rich in like manner supplieth to the poor, nothing doubting the wealth, which he received from the Lord. And this that he doeth is a great work and acceptable to God, because he understood about his wealth, and did something for the poor out of the Lord's gifts, and rightly accomplished his service to the Lord. In the sight of men the elm seemeth not to bear fruit, and they know not, neither consider that, if there come a drought, the elm having water nourisheth the vine, and the vine having continual moisture yieldeth double increase, for itself and for the elm. Thus also the poor by interceding with the Lord, for the rich fulfill their wealth, and again the rich by supplying the needs of the poor satisfy their souls. So then both become partners in the righteous work. Whoso doeth these things shall not be forsaken of God, but shall be inscribed in the books of the living. Blessed are they that have and understand, and they that are enriched by the Lord. For he that understandeth this shall be able to do some service. Third similitude. He showeth me many trees, which had no leaves, but seemed to me as if they were dry, for they were all alike. And he said to me, Seest thou these trees? I see them, sir, quoth I, looking alike and withered. He answered and said to me, These trees which thou seest are they that dwell in this world. Wherefore then, sir, quoth I, are they as if dried up and alike? Because, quoth he, neither the righteous nor the sinners appear in this world, but they are alike, for this world is winter to the righteous, and they appear not while they dwell with the sinners. For as in the winter the trees, when they have cast their leaves, are alike, and neither the dry nor the living are seen to be what they are, so in this world neither the righteous nor the sinners appear, but they are all alike. Fourth Similitude Again he showed me many trees, some shooting and some dried up, and he said to me, Seest thou these trees? I see them, sir, quoth I, some putting forth leaves, and some withered. These trees, quoth he, which are sprouting are the righteous, which shall dwell in the world to come. For the world to come is summer to the righteous, but winter to sinners. When therefore the mercy of the Lord shall shine forth, then shall they who serve God be manifested, and all shall be manifested. For as in summer the fruits of the several trees are manifested, and it is known of what kind they are, so also shall the fruits of the righteous be manifest. And all of them shall be known when they are blossoming in that world. But as thou sawest the dry trees, so the heathen and the sinners shall be found dry and unfruitful in that world, and they shall be burned like logs, and shall be manifest because their doing in their lifetime was evil. The sinners shall be burned because they sinned and repented not, and the heathen shall be burned because they knew not him who created them. Do thou therefore bear fruit, that in that summer thy fruit may be known, 
refrain from excess of business, and thou shalt commit no sin. For they who are busied overmuch also sin much, being cumbered by their affairs, and not serving their own Lord. However, quoth he, can such an one ask and receive anything from the Lord, when he doth not serve the Lord? They who serve him are they that shall receive their requests, and they who serve not the Lord shall receive nothing. But if any man be employed about one matter, he can also serve the Lord. For his mind will not be corrupted away from the Lord, but he will serve him with a pure mind. So then, if thou do these things, thou shalt be able to bear fruit unto the world to come, and whoso doeth these things shall bear fruit. Fifth Similitude Chapter 1 As I fasted and sat upon a certain mountain, and was thanking the Lord for all the things he had wrought with me, I saw the shepherd sitting by me, and saying, Why art thou come hither thus early? Because, sir, quoth I, I am keeping a station. What, quoth he, is a station? I am fasting, sir, quoth I. What fast, quoth he, is this that ye fast? As I was wont, sir, quoth I, thus I fast. Ye know not, quoth he, how to fast unto the Lord. Neither is this your unprofitable fasting unto him a fast. Wherefore, sir, quoth I, sayest thou this? I tell thee, quoth he, that this is not a fast which ye think ye a fast. But I will teach thee what is a full fast and one acceptable unto the Lord. Hearken, quoth he, God desireth not such vain fasting, for by fasting thus unto God, thou shalt do nothing for righteousness, but fast thou such a fast as this unto God. Do no wickedness in thy life, and serve the Lord with a pure heart. Keep his precepts, and walk in his ordinances, and let no evil lust arise in thy heart, but believe in God. If thou do these things, and fear him, and contain thyself from every evil deed, thou shalt live unto God. And these great things, if thou do, thou shalt accomplish a great fast, and one acceptable to God. Chapter 2 Hear the parable which I will tell thee pertaining to fasting. A certain man had a field and many slaves, and he planted part of the field as a vineyard. And having made choice of a faithful and well-pleasing honored slave, he called him unto him, and said to him, Take this vineyard which I have planted, and stake it by then I come, and do nothing else to the vineyard. Keep this my commandment, and thou shalt be a free man in my house. And the master of the slave went abroad. And when he was gone away, the slave took and staked the vineyard. And when he had made an end of staking the vineyard, he saw that it was full of weeds. So he reasoned within himself, saying, This commandment of the Lord I have fulfilled. I will go on now and dig this vineyard, and it shall be comelier when it is digged, and having no weeds it shall bear more fruit, not being choked by the weeds. And he took and digged the vineyard, and plucked out all the weeds that were in it, and that vineyard became very trim and flourishing, not having weeds choking it. After a time, the master of the slave and of the field came and entered into the vineyard, and seeing it staked trimly, and also digged, and all the weeds plucked out, and the vines flourishing, he rejoiced greatly at the works of the slave. So he called to him his beloved son, who was his heir and his friends who were his counselors, and told them what he had commanded his slave, and all that he had found done. And they rejoiced with the slave at the witness which his master bare unto him. And he said to them, I promised the slave liberty if he kept my commandment which I commanded him. And he kept my commandment, and added a good work to the vineyard, and pleased me well. In return, therefore, for this work which he hath done, I am resolved to make him fellow heir with my son. Because when he had thought a good thought, he was not negligent, but accomplished it. 
In this sentence the master's son agreed with him, and the slave should be made fellow heir with the son. A few days afterwards the master of the house made a supper, and sent him many meats from the supper, and when the slave had received the meats sent to him from the master, he took as much as was sufficient for him, and distributed the rest to his fellow servants. And when they received the meats they rejoiced, and began to pray for him that he might find greater favor with the master, because he had thus dealt with them. All these things that were come to pass his master heard, and again he rejoiced greatly at his deed. And when the master had called his friends and his son together, he told them what the slave had done with his meats, which he had received. And they were so much the more content that the slave had been made fellow heir with his son. Chapter 3 Sir, said I, I know not these parables, neither can I understand them, except thou explain them to me. I will explain all things unto thee, quoth he, and what things soever I shall speak with thee, I will show thee. Keep the commandments of the Lord, and thou shalt be in favor with God, and shall be inscribed in the number of them that keep his commandments. And if thou do any good thing beyond God's commandment, thou shalt win for thyself more exceeding glory, and shalt be more honorable with God than thou wouldest have been. If therefore, while keeping the commandments of God, thou add also these services, thou shalt rejoice, if so be thou observe them according to my commandment. I said to him, Sir, whatsoever thou commandest me, I will keep it, for I know that thou art with me. I will be with thee, quoth he, because thou hast such earnest desire of well-doing, and I will be with all who have the like earnest desire. This fasting, quoth he, when the commandments of the Lord are observed, is exceeding good. Thus then shalt thou keep this fast, which thou art about to observe. First of all, keep thyself from every evil word, and every evil desire, and cleanse thy heart from all the vanities of this world. If thou keep these things, this shall be a perfect fast for thee, and thus shalt thou do, when thou hast accomplished the things that are written, in the day when thou fastest, taste nothing but bread and water, and when thou hast told the sum of the day's expense, to which thou wouldst have been put for the meats consumed in it, thou shalt give it to a widow or an orphan or one in need. Thus shalt thou humble thyself, that he who hath received of thy humbleness may satisfy his own soul, and pray for thee to the Lord. If thou dost accomplish the fast, as I have enjoined thee, thy sacrifice shall be accepted of God, and this fast shall be registered. For the service so performed is good and agreeable, and acceptable unto the Lord. These things thou shalt thus observe with thy children, and all thy house, and if thou observe them, happy shalt thou be, and all such as hear and observe them shall be happy, and whatsoever things they ask of the Lord they shall receive. Chapter 4 I besought him much to declare unto me the parable of the field, and the master of the vineyard, and of the slave who stalked the vineyard, and of the stakes, and of the weeds that were plucked out of the vineyard, and of the son and the friends who were the counselors. For I understood that all these things were a certain parable. And he answered and said to me, Thou art very bold in asking. Thou oughtest not to ask anything at all. For if aught must be declared to thee, it shall be declared. I said to him, Sir, whatsoever things thou showest, but doest not declare unto me. In vain shall I have seen them, not understanding what they are. In like manner also, if thou speak parables unto me, but interpret them not, in vain shall I have heard aught from thee. Then again he answered me, saying, Whosoever is a servant of God, and hath his Lord in his heart, he asketh of him understanding, and receiveth it. And he solveth every parable. 
and known unto him become the words of the Lord that are spoken by parables. But such as are faint and slow unto prayer, doubt whether to ask of the Lord. Howbeit the Lord is abundant in mercy, and giveth without ceasing to all who ask of him. Thou then, who hast been endued with power by the holy angel, and hast received from him such a gift of prayer, and art not slothful, wherefore dost thou not ask understanding from the Lord, and receive it of him? I said to him, Sir, having thee with me, I must needs ask of thee and question thee, for thou showest me all things and speakest with me. But if I had seen or heard them without thee, I would have entreated the Lord that they might be declared unto me. Chapter 5 I told thee, even now, quoth he, that thou art knavish and bold in demanding the interpretations of the parables. But since thou art so persistent, I will interpret to thee the parable of the field, and all the accompaniments thereof, that thou mayest make them known to all. Hearken, quoth he, and understand them. The field is this world, and the owner of the field is he who created all things, and ordered and strengthened them. The slave is the son of God, and the vines are his people which he planted. The stakes are the holy angels of the Lord, which hold his people together. The weeds that were plucked out of the vineyard are the iniquities of the servants of God. The meats sent to the slave from the supper are the commandments which he gave to his people through his son. The friends and the counselors are the holy angels which were first created, and the going abroad of the master is the time he remaineth over until his coming. I said to him, Sir, all these things are of great and wondrous and glorious sort. Could I then possibly have understood them? No, nor can any other man, though he were exceedingly prudent, understand them. Yet further, sir, quoth I, declare unto me that which I am about to ask of thee. Say, quoth he, that thou wilt. Wherefore, sir, quoth I, is the Son of God set in the character of a slave in the parable? Chapter 6 Hearken, quoth he, the Son of God is not set in the character of a slave, but in great authority and lordship. How, sir, quoth I, I understand not. Because, quoth he, God planted the vineyard, that is to say, he created the people, and he delivered them to his Son, and the Son gave the angels charge over them, to keep them, and himself purged their sins, when he had labored much and borne many troubles. For none can dig without toil or trouble. Having then himself purged the sins of the people, he showed them the paths of life, giving them the law which he had received from his father. Thou seest, quoth he, that he is lord of the people, having received all authority from his father. Hear also how that the Lord took counsel with his son and the holy angels about the inheritance of the slave. The pre-existent Holy Spirit, which created the whole creation, did God make to dwell in flesh which he chose. This flesh, when, wherein the Holy Spirit dwelt, served the Spirit rightly, walking in sanctity and purity, and in no wise defiling the Spirit. When, therefore, it had lived orderly and purely, and labored and wrought with the Spirit in every matter, quitting itself stoutly and valiantly, he chose it for a partner with the Holy Spirit. For the way of this flesh pleased the Lord, because it defiled not itself upon the earth when it had the Holy Spirit. Accordingly, he took the Son and the glorious angels for counselors, that this flesh also, when it had served the Spirit, plainlessly might have some abiding place, and might not seem to have lost the reward of its service. For all flesh found undefiled and spotless, wherein the Holy Spirit hath dwelt, shall receive a reward. Thou hast the interpretation of this parable also. Chapter 7 I was glad, sir, quoth I, to hear this interpretation. Attend now, quoth he, Keep this thy flesh pure and undefiled, that the spirit which dwelleth in it may bear witness to it, and thy flesh may be justified. 
Beware, lest thought arise in thy heart, that this thy flesh is to perish, and thou abuse it with any pollution. If thou pollute thy flesh, thou shalt pollute the Holy Spirit also, the which, if thou pollute, thou shalt not live. But if, sir, quoth I, there hath been any previous ignorance before these words were heard, how can the man who hath defiled his flesh be saved? Of the former deeds of ignorance, quoth he, it is possible for God alone to give healing, for all power is his. But now guard thyself, and the Almighty Lord, who is abundant in mercy, will grant healing of the former ignorances, if from henceforth thou defile neither thy flesh nor the spirit. For the two are in communion, and they cannot be defiled apart from one another. Keep therefore pure, and thou shalt live unto God. End of Similitude 1 through 5Similitude 6 through 8 of Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Six Similitude, Chapter 1. As I sat in my house and was glorifying the Lord for all the things that I had seen, and thinking about the commandments, how that they are good and mighty and pleasant and glorious, and able to save a man's soul, I said within myself, Happy shall I be if I walk in these commandments, and whosoever walketh in them shall be happy. While I was speaking on this wise within myself, of a sudden I spied the shepherd sitting beside me, and saying, What doubtest thou concerning the commandments which I commanded thee? They are good, doubt not at all, but put on the faith of the Lord, and thou shalt walk in them, and I will strengthen thee in them. These commandments are profitable to such as are about to repent, for except they walk in them, the repentance is in vain. Do ye therefore who repent cast off the wickedness of this world, which wear you away? And having put on every virtue of righteousness, ye shall be able to observe these commandments, and no longer to add to your sins. If ye add no more at all to them, ye shall depart from your former sins. Walk then in these my commandments, and ye shall live unto God. All these things have been told you by me. After he had spoken these things with me, he said to me, Go we into the field, and I will show thee the shepherds of the sheep. Let us go, sir, quoth I. So we came to a certain plain, and he showed me a youthful shepherd, decked with a set of garments of saffron color. Now he was feeding exceeding many sheep, and these sheep seemed to be pampered and very wanton, and they made merry as they leaped hither and thither, and the shepherd himself was quite merry over his flock, and his countenance was very cheerful, and he was skipping about among the sheep, and the other sheep I saw pampered and wanton, but which were in one place and not leaping about. Chapter 2 and the shepherd said to me, Seest thou this pastor? I see him, sir, quoth I. This, quoth he, is the angel of luxury and deceit. He weareth out the souls of God's servants, and subverteth them from the truth, cheating them with evil lusts, whereby they perish. For they forget the commandments of the living God, and walk in vain deceits and delights, and are destroyed by this angel some unto death, and some unto decay. I said to him, Sir, I know not the meaning of unto death, and of unto decay. Here, quoth he, the sheep which thou sawest merry and leaping about, these are they that have been utterly drawn away from God, and have yielded themselves to the lusts of this world. In them there is no repentance unto life, for they add to their sins, and blasphemed against the name of God. To such men belongeth death. And the sheep which thou sawest not leaping about, but feeding in one place, these are they that have yielded themselves to pleasures and deceits, but have not blasphemed at all against the Lord. These have been corrupted from the truth, but they have hope of repentance, whereby they may live. Decay, then, hath hope of a renewal, but death hath everlasting destruction. 
again we went on a little and he showed me a tall shepherd like a wild man in appearance clad in a white goatskin and having a scrip upon his shoulders and a very strong staff with knots and a great scourge and his look was very severe so that i was dismayed at him such was his look now the shepherd was receiving the sheep that were pampered and wanton but not leaping about from the youthful shepherd and was casting them into a steep place full of thorns and briars so that the sheep could not loose themselves from the thorns and briars but were entangled in them these then fed thus entangled among the thorns and briars and being smitten by him they were very wretched and he drove them about to and fro and gave them no rest so that those sheep had no quietness at all chapter three seeing them so scourged and in misery i was grieved over them because they were thus tormented and had no respite at all and i said to the shepherd who was speaking with me sir who is this shepherd that is so unmerciful and cruel and quite without pity upon these sheep this quoth he is the angel of retribution and he is one of the righteous angels and is set over punishment he receiveth therefore such as have strayed away from god and walked in the lusts and deceits of this world and punishes them with dreadful and diverse punishments according to their deserving i would fain know sir quoth i of what sort are these diverse punishments here quoth he the diverse punishments and torments and torments during lifetime for some are punished with losses some with wants some with sundry infirmities some with all unsettlement and some being insulted by the unworthy and by suffering many other mishaps for many who are unstable in their counsels take in hand over much and nothing succeeds at all with them then they say that they are not prospered in their affairs and it entereth not into their heart that they have done amiss but they blame the lord when therefore they have been afflicted with all manner of affliction they are delivered to me for good instruction and made strong in the faith of the lord and the rest of the days of their life they serve the lord with a pure heart and if they repent the evil things that they have done come into their mind and then they glorify god saying that he is a just judge and that they have suffered justly each according to his doings and thenceforth they serve the lord with a pure heart and are prospered in all their doings receiving from the lord all things that they ask and then they glorify the lord for that they were delivered to me and they never again suffer any ill chapter four i said to him sir show me this further what inquirest thou more quoth he whether sir quoth i they who live in luxury and deceit are tormented for as long a while as they lived in luxury and deceit he said to me they are tormented for the same time then they are tormented very little sir quoth i for they who thus live in pleasure and forget god ought to be tormented sevenfold he said to me thou art foolish and understandest not the power of torment surely sir quoth i if i had understood i should not have asked thee to declare it unto me here quoth he the power of both of them of pleasure and of torment the time of pleasure and deceit is one hour but the hour of torment hath the force of thirty days if then a man pass one day in pleasure and deceit and be tormented for one day the day of torment equaleth a whole year as many days therefore as one liveth in pleasure so many years is he tormented thou seest then quoth he that the time of pleasure and deceit is very short and the time of punishment and torture long chapter five inasmuch sir quoth i as i have not quite understood about the times of deceit and pleasure and of pain do thou show them to me more evidently he answered and said to me thy folly is abiding and thou wilt not cleanse thy heart and serve god beware lest the time be fulfilled and thou be found foolish 
Here then, quoth he, as thou desirest, that thou mayest understand the matter. He who spendeth one day in luxury and deceit, and in doing what pleaseth him, is wrapped in much folly, and understandeth not the thing that he doeth. For by the morrow he forgetteth what he did the day before. For luxury and deceit have no memories, on account of the folly in which they are folden. But when punishment and torment cleave to a man one day, he is punished in sore pain for a year, because punishment and torment have long memories. Being then tormented and punished all the year, he remembereth at length the luxury and deceit, and knoweth that on account of them he suffereth the evil things. All men, therefore, who live in luxury and deceit are thus punished, because, having life, they have delivered themselves up to death. What manner of pleasures, sir, quoth I, are hurtful? Every act, quoth he, which he doeth gladly is a pleasure to a man. The passionate man, in satisfying his own temper, delighteth himself. And the adulterer, and the drunkard, and the slanderer, and the liar, and the covetous, and the defrauder, and they who do the like to these things indulge their proper disease, each taking pleasure in what he doeth. All these pleasures are hurtful to the servants of God, and because of these deceits do they suffer who are punished and tormented. But there are also pleasures which save men, for many when they do good things delight in them, being carried along by their own enjoyment. This pleasure is profitable to the servants of God, and winneth life for such a man. But the hurtful pleasures before said purchase for them pains and punishments, and if they persist and repent not, they bring death upon themselves. Seventh Similitude A few days afterwards I saw him on the same plain where I had seen the shepherds, and he said to me, What more seekest thou? I am come, sir, quoth I, that thou mayest bid the avenging sheep go out of my house, for he afflicteth me sorely. Need is, quoth he, that thou shouldest be afflicted, seeing the glorious angel hath thus ordained concerning thee, for he desireth that thou shouldest be proved. But, sir, quoth I, what so evil thing have I done that I should be delivered to this angel? Here, quoth he, thy sins are many, yet not so many as that thou shouldest be delivered to this angel. But thy house have committed great iniquities and sins, and the glorious angel was very wroth at their deeds, and therefore ordained that thou shouldest be afflicted for a while, that they also may repent and cleanse themselves from every lust of this world. When therefore they repent and are cleansed, then the avenging angel shall depart. I said to him, Sir, if they have done such things that the glorious angel is angered, yet what have I done? They, quoth he, cannot else be afflicted, except thou, the head of all the house, be afflicted. For when thou art afflicted of necessity, they too shall be afflicted. But so long as thou prosperest, they can suffer no affliction. But behold, sir, quoth I, they have repented with their whole heart. I also know, quoth he, that they have repented with their whole heart. Thinkest thou, then, that the sins of those who repent are straightway remitted? By no means. But he who repenteth must vex his own soul, and humble himself mightily in all that he doeth, and be afflicted with all the different afflictions. And if he endure the afflictions that come upon him, he who created and strengthened all things will surely have mercy and grant a healing. This will he do when he seeth the heart of him that repenteth pure from every evil deed. But for thee and for thy house it is expedient now to be afflicted. Yet why should I say many things to thee? Thou must needs be afflicted, as that angel of the Lord which delivered thee to me hath ordained. And herein thank thou the Lord, for that he hath accounted thee worthy to have thine affliction showed thee before so that foreknowing it, thou mayest bear it steadfastly. I said to him, Sir, be thou with me, and I shall be able to bear all adversity. I, quoth he, will be with thee. 
and I will also entreat the avenging angel to afflict thee more lightly. Yet a little while thou shalt be afflicted, and again thou shalt be restored to thy house. Only continue to be of lowly mind, and serve the Lord with a pure heart, thou and thy children and thy house, and walk in my commandments which I command thee, and thy repentance shall be able to be effectual and pure. If thou keep them with thy house, all affliction shall depart from thee. And affliction, quoth he, shall depart from all such as walk in these my commandments. Eighth Similitude Chapter 1 He showed me a great willow tree, overshadowing plains and mountains, under the shelter whereof were gathered all who were called by the name of the Lord. And beside the willow stood an angel of the Lord, glorious and exceeding tall, holding a great sickle, and he was lopping branches from the willow, and distributing them to the people which sheltered around it, giving them small rods about a cubit long. And when all had received the rods, the angel put down the sickle, and the tree was still whole, as I had seen it. Thereupon I marveled, and said within myself, How when so many branches have been lopped off is the tree whole? And the shepherd said to me, Marvel not that the tree remained whole when so many branches were lopped off, but let be till thou hast seen all things, and it shall be showed thee what is the meaning. Then the angel which had distributed the rods to the people demanded them back from them. As they had received them, so they were summoned unto him, and all of them gave up their rods, and the angel of the Lord took and examined them. From some he received the rods dry, and eaten as by the moth. And the angel commanded such as had given up their rods like this to stand apart. Others gave them up dry, not moth-eaten, and these he commanded to stand apart. Others gave them up half dry, and these stood apart. And others gave up their rods half dry, and with clefts, and these stood apart. And others gave up their rods green but with clefts, and these stood apart. And others gave up their rods half dry and half green, and these stood apart. Others brought their rods two parts green and the third part dry, and these stood apart. And others gave them up two parts dry and the third green, and these stood apart. Others gave up their rods well nigh all green, only a very little of them at the end was dry and they had clefts in them, and these stood apart. And of the rods of others, a very little was green, and the rest dry, and these stood apart. Others came bringing their rods green, as they had received them from the angel. The most part of the multitude gave up their rods thus, and the angel was very glad of them, and these stood apart. Others gave up their rods green and with shoots, and these stood apart, and the angel was very glad of these. And others gave up their rods green and with shoots, and their shoots had, as it were, a kind of fruit. And the men whose rods were found so were very joyful, and the angel rejoiced over them, and the shepherd was exceeding glad of them. Chapter 2 And the angel of the Lord ordered crowns to be brought, and crowns made as of palms were brought, and he crowned the men who had given up the rods which had the shoots and the fruit, and sent them away to the tower. And to the tower he sent also those who had given up the rods that were green and had shoots, but not shoots bearing fruit, and he gave them a seal. All who went into the tower had like raiment, white as snow, and he sent away those who had given up their rods, green as they received them, giving them white raiment and seals. When the angel had finished all this, he said to the shepherd, I go my way, and thou shalt send these men to the walls, according as each is worthy to dwell. Examine their rods carefully, and so send them away, but examine them very carefully. Take heed, quoth he, that none escape thee, but if any escape thee, I will prove them at the altar. When he had thus spoken to the shepherd, he departed. After the departure of the angel, the shepherd said to me, Let us take and plant the rods of all of them, to see if any of them can live. I said to him, Sir, 
how can these dry things live? He answered me, saying, This tree being a willow is of a lively sort. If therefore the rods be planted and receive a little moisture, many of them shall live. So then, let us make trial and pour water over them. If any of them be able to revive, I shall rejoice with it. And if it live not, it shall not be found negligent. Then the shepherd bade me call them, as each stood, and they came rank by rank, and gave up their rods to the shepherd. And he took the rods and planted them in rows, and after planting them he poured much water upon them, so that the rods appeared not because of the water. And after he had watered the rods, he said to me, Let us go away and come back after a few days, and look at all the rods. For he who created this tree willeth that all who received branches from it should live. And I also hope that, when these slips have received moisture, and been watered, the most part of them shall live. Chapter 3 I said to him, Sir, acquaint me what this tree is, for I am perplexed about it. Because when so many branches have been lopped off, the tree is whole, and nothing seems to have been cut from it. Thereat I am perplexed. Hearken, quoth he, this great tree, which overspreadeth plains and mountains and the whole earth, is the law of God, which was given to all the world. And this law is the Son of God, who hath been preached unto the ends of the earth. The peoples under the shadow of it are they who, when they heard the preaching, believed on him. And the great and glorious angel is Michael, who hath the authority over this people and governeth them. For it is he who putteth the law into the hearts of them that believe. He therefore visiteth those to whom he hath given it, to see if so be they have kept it. Thou seest the rods of all of them, for the rods are the law. Thou seest many of the rods made useless, and thou shalt know all them that keep not the law. Thou shalt see the abode of every one. I said to him, Sir, wherefore? Did he send some away to the tower, and leave some to thee? As many, quoth he, as transgressed the law which they received from him, he left in my charge for repentance. But he hath in his own power such as satisfied and kept the law. Who then, sir, quoth I, are they that are crowned and entered the tower? Quoth he, all such as wrestled with the devil, and vanquished him are crowned. These are they that have suffered for the law, and those others who likewise give up their rods green and having shoots, but without fruit, are they that have been afflicted for the sake of the law, but neither suffered death nor denied their law. And they who give them up green as they receive them are holy and just men, who walked earnestly with a pure heart, and have kept the commandments of the Lord. The rest shalt thou learn when I have examined the rods which have been planted and watered. Chapter 4 After a few days we returned to the place, and the shepherd sat in the place of the angel, and I stood beside him. And he said to me, Gird thee with raw flax and serve me. So I girded myself with clean raw linen sackcloth, and seeing me girt about, and ready to minister to him, call, quoth he, the man whose rods were planted, each in the order in which he gave up his rod. And I went away to the plain and summoned all of them, and they stood all in their ranks. And he said to them, Let each pluck up his own rod and bring it to me. The first to give up the rods were they that had them dry and frettered, and so they were found still dry and frettered. And he commanded them to stand apart. Next, they who had had the dry but not frettered ones give them up, and some of these give up their rods green, and some dry and frettered, as by the moth. Those who give up their rods green he commanded to stand apart, and those who give up the dry and frettered ones he commanded to stand with the first. Then they with the half-dry ones that had clefts give them up, and many of these give them up green and without clefts, and some green and having shoots, and upon them fruits, like as upon those of the men who went crowned to the tower. 
Others give up their rods dry and gnawed, and others dry but not gnawed, and others half dry and with clefts as they were before. And he commanded them, every man severally, to stand aside, some in their own orders and some apart. Chapter 5 Then they with the rods, which had been green and cloven, gave them up. These all gave them up green, and they stood in their own order. And the shepherd was joyful over these, because they were all changed and had put off their clefts. They also that had had them half green and half dry gave them up. And the rods of some of them were found wholly green, those of some half dry, of some dry and gnawed, and of some green and with shoots. These were all sent away, every one to his order. Then they, with the two parts green and the third part dry, gave them up. Many of these presented them green, many half dry, others dry and gnawed, and they all stood in their own order. Next, they who had had them two parts dry and the third part green gave them up. Many of them gave them up half dry, some dry and gnawed, some half dry and with clefts, and a few green, and these all stood in their own order. They also who had had their rods green with a very small part dry and with clefts gave them up. Some of these gave them up green, and some green and with shoots. And they went away to their rank. Afterwards they, with a very small part green, and the rest dry, gave them up. And the rods of these were found mostly green, and with shoots and fruit on the shoots, and others all green. Over these rods the shepherd rejoiced very exceedingly, because they were found so. And these went away, every man to his own order. Chapter 6 after the shepherd had examined the rods of all of them, he said to me, I told thee that this tree is one that loveth life. Seest thou, quoth he, how many repented and were saved? I see, sir, quoth I. It is that thou mayest perceive, quoth he, the abounding compassion of the Lord. How that it is great and glorious, and he gave the spirit to them that were meet for repentance. Wherefore then, sir, quoth I, did not all repent? To them, quoth he, whom he saw ready to become pure in heart, and to serve him with their whole heart, he granted repentance. But to those in whom he saw guile and wickedness, and who would have repented in hypocrisy, he gave not repentance, lest they should again profane his name. I said to him, Sir, Declare to me, therefore, now concerning those who have given up the rods, of what sort each of them is, and what is their abode, to the end that they may hearken who believed, and have received the seal, and broken it, and not kept it whole, and having conscience of their deeds may repent and receive a seal from thee, and may glorify the Lord, for that he had mercy on them, and sent thee to renew their spirits. Hearken, quoth he, they whose rods were found dry and eaten by moths are the apostates and betrayers of the church, who blasphemed the Lord by their sins, yea, and were ashamed of the name of the Lord by which they are called. These, therefore, were utterly lost unto God. Thou seest that not one of them repented, although they had heard the words thou spokest against them, which I commanded thee. From such like life hath departed. They who give up the rods that were dry but not decayed are nigh unto them, for they were hypocrites and bringers in of strange doctrines, who turned aside the servants of God, especially those who had sinned, not suffering them to repent, but persuading them by their foolish teachings. These, however, have hope of repentance. Thou seest that many of them have indeed repented from when thou spakest my commands unto them, and yet more shall repent. Such as would not repent lost their life, but whoso of them repented became good and had their dwelling within the first walls, and some even went up into the tower. Thou seest then, quoth he, that repentance from sins hath with it life, but impenitence death. Chapter 7 
Here also, about such as give up their rods half dry and with clefts in them, they whose rods were simply half dry are men of two minds, for they neither live nor are dead. But they who had them half dry and with clefts in them are double minded and also slanderous, never peaceable with one another, but always at variance. But even to these repentance is offered. Thou seest, quoth he, that some of them have repented, and there is still hope of repentance among them. Such of them, quoth he, as have repented, have their abode in the tower. The more tardy in their repentance shall dwell within the walls, and all such as repent not but persist in their doings shall die the death. They who give up their rods green and with clefts were always faithful and good, albeit they had jealousy with one another about precedence and dignity. These are all foolish, inasmuch as they have questions among them about precedence. Nevertheless, they too, when they heard my commandments, being good men, cleansed themselves and repented quickly. They had their habitation, therefore, in the tower. But if any one convert again unto dissension, he shall be cast forth from the tower, and shall lose his life. Life belongeth to all who keep the commandments of the Lord. And in the commandments there is nothing about precedence or any honor, but about patience and lowliness of mind in a man. In such like, therefore, is the life of the Lord, but in them that are contentious and lawless, death. Chapter 8 Those who give up their rods, half green and half dry, are those who are much engaged in traffic, and cleave not to the saints. Because of this, the half of them is alive, and the half dead. Many who heard my commandments repented, and such indeed have repented, have their dwelling in the tower. But some fell away utterly. These have no repentance, because by reason of their traffickings, they blasphemed and denied the Lord, and so they lost their life through the wickedness which they did. Many of them were of doubtful mind. These may yet repent, if they will repent quickly, and their dwelling shall be in the tower. But if they delay their repentance, they shall dwell in the enclosure. And if they repent not, they likewise forfeit their life. The men who give up the two parts green and the third part dry are those who had denied with manifold denials. Many of them repented and went away to dwell in the tower, but many revolted utterly from God. These forever lost the power to live, and some of them were double-minded and factious. These may repent, if they will repent quickly, and not continue in their pleasures. But if they continue in their doings, these also work death to themselves. Chapter 9 Those who give up their rods, two parts dry, and the third green, are they that had been faithful, but when they were grown rich and of reputation among the heathen, they put on great pride and became high-minded, and forsook the truth and clave not to the righteous, but lived with the heathen after their manner. In this way was the more agreeable unto them. Yet they revolted not from God, but continued in the faith, although not working the works of the faith. Many of them, however, repented, and had their habitation in the tower. But others, who consorted with the heathen unto the end, and were corrupted by their vain opinions, fell away from God, and did the deeds of the heathen. These were reckoned among the heathen, and others of them doubted, having no hope to be saved on account of the deeds they had done. And some doubted and made schisms among themselves. For these who doubted because of their doings, there is yet repentance, but their repentance must be speedy, that their abode may be within the tower. For them that repent not, but abide in their pleasures, death is nigh. Chapter 10 Those who give up their rods green, with only the ends dry and split, were always good and faithful and honorable before God. But they sinned a very little because of trivial lusts and small things that they had against one another. Yet when they heard my words, the most part of them repented quickly, and so their dwelling was in the tower. But some of them doubted, and some by their doubts multiplied dissension. In these there is still hope of repentance, because they were always good, and hardly shall any one of them perish. 
Those who give up the rods dry and with a very little green are they that only believed and worked the works of iniquity. Yet they never fell away from God, and they bear the name gladly, and gladly received the servants of God into their houses. When, therefore, they heard of this repentance, they repented without wavering, and they practiced all virtue and righteousness. And some of them even suffer affliction willingly, knowing their deeds which they did. The dwelling of all these, therefore, shall be in the tower. Chapter 11 After he had finished the explanations of all the rods, he said to me, Go thy way, and bid all repent, and they shall live unto God. For the Lord, being moved with compassion, sent me to give repentance to all, although some were not meet because of their works. Nevertheless, the Lord, being long-suffering, willeth that the calling given through his Son should stand sure. I said to him, Sir, I hope that all, when they hear thereof, will repent, for I am persuaded that every one, when he considereth his own deeds and feareth God, will repent. He answered and said unto me, All such as repent with their whole heart, and cleanse themselves from all wickedness, before said, and never again add aught to their sins, shall receive from the Lord healing of their former sins. If they doubt not about these commandments, and they shall live unto God. But such, quoth he, as add to their sins, and have their conversation in the lusts of this world, condemn themselves unto death. Walk thou thyself in my commandments, and thou shalt live unto God. And all who walk in them, and order themselves aright, shall live unto God. When he had showed and spoken to me all these things, he said unto me, The rest will I show forth unto thee after a few days. End of Similitudes 6 through 8. Similitude 9 and 10 of Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Similitude, Chapter 1. After I had written the commands and parables of the shepherd, the angel of repentance, he came to me and said unto me, I wish to show thee whatsoever things the Holy Spirit, which spake with thee in the form of the church, showed thee. For that Spirit is the Son of God. While thou wast yet weak in the flesh, they were not declared unto thee through an angel. When, therefore, thou hast first been empowered by the Spirit, and confirmed in thy strength, so that thou couldst even look upon an angel, then the building of the tower was manifested unto thee by the church. Thou saw all things in goodly and solemn fashion, as the showing of a virgin. Now thou seest them shown by an angel through the same spirit. But thou must learn all things more carefully from me. For hereunto was I given by the glorious angel to dwell in thine house, that thou mayest behold all things steadfastly, and nothing terrified as heretofore. Then he led me away to a certain doomed mountain in Arcadia, and seated me on the top of the mountain, and he showed me a great plain, and round about the plain twelve mountains, different in appearance from one another. The first was black as soot, the second bare without herbage, the third thorny and full of briars, the fourth had herbs which were half withered, the upper parts of the herbs green and the parts at the root dry, and some of the herbs were dried up when the sun grew hot. The fifth mountain had green herbs and was rough. The sixth mountain was full of clefts, some small and some great, and the clefts had herbs in them, not yet indeed very flourishing ones, but rather as if they had been blighted. The seventh mountain had pleasant plants and was all well liking. The cattle and the birds of every kind found pasture upon that mountain. Nevertheless, as the beasts and the fowls went on feeding, the herbage of that mountain throve more and more. The eighth mountain was full of springs, and creatures of the Lord of every kind drank of the springs of that mountain. The ninth mountain had no water at all, but was everywhere like a desert and it had in it deadly beasts and creeping things hurtful to men. 
The ninth mountain had very great trees, and was shady throughout. The sheep lay resting and ruminating in the shade. The eleventh mountain was very thick with trees, and the trees were covered with fruit. They made so fair a show with all manner of fruits that any one seeing them would long to eat of their fruits. The twelfth mountain was all white and had a pleasant aspect, and the mountain was of most excellent beauty in itself. Chapter 2 And in the midst of the plain he showed me a great white rock, which rose up from the plain. The rock which was higher than the mountains was four square, and such that it could contain the whole world. The rock was ancient, and it had had a gate hewn out of it, but the framing of the gate seemed to me to be recent, and the gate was more glittering than the sun, insomuch that I marveled at the radiance of the gate. Round about the gate stood twelve virgins, of whom the four standing at the corners seemed to me the more glorious, albeit the others also were glorious, and they stood at the four quarters of the gate, with two virgins between each pair of them, and they wore linen tunics, and were becomingly girded, but had their shoulders uncovered, as if about to bear some burden. So ready were they, for they were very cheerful and zealous. When I had observed these things, I wondered within myself, for that the things I saw were great and glorious. And again I was perplexed concerning the virgins, because being so delicate they stood mannishly, as if about to carry the whole heaven. And the shepherd said to me, Why debate and doubt within yourself, and bring grief upon thee? The things thou canst not understand assay not, seeing thou art prudent. But pray the Lord that thou mayest receive wisdom to understand them. What is behind thee thou canst not see, but thou beholdest the things in front. What thou canst not see, let alone, and trouble not thyself, but master the things which thou beholdest, and be not busied about the rest. All things whatsoever I shall show thee, I will make plain unto thee. Have regard, therefore, to the things which remain. Chapter 3 Then I saw six men newly come, tall and glorious, and alike in appearance. And they summoned a multitude of men, and they too who came were tall and goodly and strong. And the six men commanded them to build a certain tower over the rock and over the gate. Great was the noise made by those men who were come to build the tower as they ran hither and thither round the gate. Moreover, the virgins who stood round about the gate spake to the men that they should hasten the building of the tower. And the virgins had their hands spread out, as if they looked to receive something from the men. Now the six men were commanding stones to come up from a certain deep and go into the building of the tower. And there came up ten square bright stones, not hewn. Then the six men called the virgins, and commanded them to carry all the stones, which were to go into the building of the tower, and to pass through the gate, and deliver them to the men who were going to build the tower. So the virgins, one with another, placed the first ten stones, which rose out of the deep, upon them, and all of them carried the stones one by one. Chapter 4 as they stood ranged about the gate, so they who seemed to be strong ones lifted them, putting themselves under the corners of a stone, and the others stooped under the sides of it, and so they bare all the stones. They carried them through the gate as they were bidden, and delivered them to the men for the tower, and they having the stones builded. The building of the tower was upon the great rock and over the gate. Those ten stones were first fitted together and covered the whole rock, and they were made a foundation for the building of the tower, and the rock and the gate bear up the whole tower. After the ten stones, twenty-five other stones rose up out of the deep, and these also were fitted into the building of the tower, being carried by the virgins like the former ones. After them rose up thirty-five, and these in like manner were fitted into the tower. 
After these came up forty other stones, and all these were cast into the building of the tower. So there were four tiers in the foundations of the tower. Then the stones ceased to come up from the deep, and the builders ceased a little. Then again the six men ordered the multitude of the throng to bring stones from the mountains for the building of the tower. Stones, therefore, of diverse colors, hewn by the men, were brought from all the mountains and handed to the virgins, and the virgins carried them through the gate and delivered them for the building of the tower. And when the various stones were put into the building, they changed their diverse hues and became all alike white. Some stones, however, were presented by the men for the building and did not turn bright, but were found still the same as when they were placed there. For they had not been handed in by the virgins, neither carried through the gate. These stones, therefore, were unsightly in the building of the tower. Then the six men, when they saw the unsightly stones in the building, ordered them to be taken away and deposited in their proper place, whence they were brought. And they said to the men who were bringing the stones, Hand ye in no stones at all yourselves for the building, but lay them beside the tower, that the virgins may convey them through the gate and present them for the building. For if, quoth they, they be not brought through the gate by the hands of these virgins, they cannot change their colors. Labor not therefore, quoth they, in vain. Chapter 5 In that day the building ended, and the tower was not finished, for it was afterwards to be built up further. Only there was a delay in the building, and the six men commanded all the builders to retire a little and rest. But the virgins they ordered not to withdraw from the tower, and it seemed to me that the virgins were left behind to guard the tower. Then after all the men had withdrawn and were resting, I said to the shepherd, Wherefore, sir, was the building of the tower not finished? The tower, quoth he, cannot be completed until the Lord thereof shall have come and proved this building, so that if any stones be found rotten, he may change them. For the tower is being built according to his will. I would know, sir, quoth I, about the tower, what the building of it meaneth, and about the rock and the gate and the mountains and the virgins, and the stones which rose up from the deep and were not hewn but went as they were into the building. And why first ten stones were laid in the foundations, then twenty-five, then thirty-five, then forty, and about the stones that went into the building, but were taken away again and put back into their own place. About all these things, sir, set my soul at rest, and acquaint me. If, quoth he, thou be found not vainly curious, thou shalt know them all. After a few days we will return hither, and thou shalt see the remaining things that are to come upon this tower, and thou shalt know all the parables exactly. So after a few days we came to the place where we had sat, and he said to me, Let us go unto the tower, for the owner of the tower cometh to survey it. And we came to the tower, but no one at all was by it except the virgins only. And the shepherd asked the virgins if the master of the tower had arrived, and they answered that he would presently come to inspect the building. Chapter 6 And lo, after a little while I beheld an array of many men approaching, and in the midst of them was a man of so great stature that he overtopped the tower. The six men, who were the master builders, walked with him. On the right hand and on the left, and all who labored in the building were with him, and many other glorious ones round about him. Then the virgins who kept the tower ran to him and kissed him, and began to walk near to him round the tower. And that man inspected the building carefully, feeling every single stone, and holding a staff in his hand. He smote every one of the stones that had been laid. And as he struck, some of them became black as soot, some scabbed, some cracked, some stunted, some neither white nor black, some rough and not answerable to the other stones, and some much speckled. Such were the diversities of the stones which were found rotten in the building, 
and he commanded all these to be removed from the tower, and placed beside the tower, and other stones to be brought and laid in their place. Thereupon the builders asked him from what mountain he would have stones brought and laid in their place, and he commanded them to be brought not from the mountains, but from a certain plain which was nigh. So the plain was digged, and there were found bright four square stones, and also some round ones. And all the stones that were in that plain were brought, and were carried through the gate by the virgins. The square stones were hewn, and put in the place of those taken away. But the round ones were not put into the building, because they were hard to hew, and it could be done but slowly. And they were put beside the tower, as if ready to be hewn and placed in the building, for they were bright. Chapter 7 When the glorious man, the lord of the whole tower, had made an end of these things, he called the shepherd unto him, and delivered to him all the stones lying beside the tower, which had been cast out from the building, and said unto him, Polish these stones carefully, and place such of them as can fit with the rest in the building of the tower. But those which fit not hurl far away from the tower. Having thus given commandment to the shepherd, he departed from the tower along with all the men with whom he had come. But the virgin stood round about the tower watching it. Then I said to the shepherd, How can these stones go again into the building of the tower when they have been disallowed? He answered and said to me, Seest thou these stones? I see them, sir, quoth I. I, quoth he, will hew the most part of these stones, and lay them in the building, and they shall fit with the rest of the stones. How, sir, quoth I, when they have been chipped about, can they fill up the same room? He answered and said to me, All that are found small shall be cast into the midst of the building, and such are larger shall be placed on the outside and hold them together. When he had thus spoken with me, he said unto me, Let us go away and come back after two days, and purge these stones and cast them into the building. For all about the tower must be cleansed, lest perchance the master come suddenly and find the environs of the tower filthy and be provoked, and these stones go not into the building of the tower. And I appeared negligent unto the master. After two days, then, we came to the tower, and he said unto me, Let us examine all the stones, and see which of them can go into the building. Let us examine them, sir, said I. Chapter 8 And beginning first, we examined the black stones, and they were found just as they were when they were put out of the building, and the shepherd commanded them to be removed from the tower and set apart. Next he examined the scabbed ones, and he took and hewed many of them, and commanded the virgins to take them up and lay them in the building. And the virgins took them up and placed them in the building of the tower in the midst. But the residue he ordered to be placed with the black ones, for they also were found black. Then he examined those which had the clefts, and he hewed many of them, and ordered them to be taken away by the virgins to the building. These were placed outside, because they were seen to be sounder. But the rest, on account of the multitude of their rifts, could not be planed. For this cause they were cast away from the building of the tower. Then he examined the stunted ones, and many among them were found black, and some had formed great clefts. And he ordered these also to be put with those which had been cast away. And he cleansed and hewed those of them that remained over, and commanded them to be put into the building. And the virgins took them up and fitted them into the midst of the tower, for they were of the weaker sort. Next he examined the half-white and half-black ones, and many of them were then found black, and he commanded these likewise to be removed along with those which had been cast away. And the rest were all found white, and were taken up by the virgins, and being white were fitted by them into the building, and they were placed on the outer side, because they were found to be sound. 
so that they could hold fast those which were put inside, for nothing at all of them was stunted. Then he examined the hard and rough ones, and a few of them were thrown away because they could not be hewn, for they were found exceedingly hard, and the rest of them were hewn, and they were taken by the virgins and fitted into the middlemost of the building of the tower, because they were weaker. Then he examined those which had the spots, and a very few of these had turned black and were thrown away to the rest. But those which remained over were found bright and sound, and they were fitted into the building by the virgins, and were laid outwards because of their strength. Chapter 9 Afterwards he came to examine the white round stones, and he said unto me, What shall we do with these stones? What know I, sir, quoth I? He said unto me, Hast thou no plan for them? Sir, quoth I, I have not this craft. I am not a hewer of stones, neither can devise aught. Seest thou not, quoth he, that they are very round, and that if I would make them square, must much be cut away from them, albeit some of them must needs be put into the building. If then, sir, quoth I, it must needs be, why vex thyself? Why not choose out of those thou wilt for the building, and fit them into it? So he chose out of the larger and the bright ones of them, and hewed them, and the virgins took them up and fitted them into the outward parts of the building. But the rest that remained over were taken away and laid by the plain whence they were brought. They were not, however, cast away, because, quoth he, a little of the tower yet remaineth to be built, and the master of the tower is minded that these stones at all events should be fitted into the building, because they are very bright. Then twelve women were called, of very stately form, and clothed in black, girt about, and with their shoulders exposed, and their hair loose. They seemed to me to be wild women, and the shepherd ordered them to take up the stones that were rejected from the building, and carry them away to the mountains whence they had been brought. And they gladly took them up, and carried away all the stones, and place them where they had been all taken from. Then when the stones had been all taken away, and not a stone lay any longer about the tower, the shepherd said unto me, Let us go round the tower, and see if anything is wanting to it. So I went round with him, and when the shepherd saw that the tower was of a very fair structure, he was very glad, for the tower was so builded, that when I beheld the building I desired it, for it was built as it were of one stone, and with no joint at all therein. And the stone appeared as if hewn out of the rock, for it seemed to me to be a monolith. Chapter 10 As I walked with him, I was glad at seeing such goodly things. And the shepherd said to me, Go and bring lime and fine potter's earth, that I may fill up the prints of the stones which were taken up and laid in the building for all about the tower must be made even. And I did as he commanded, and brought them unto me. Then quoth he, Minister thou unto me, and the work shall presently be accomplished. And he filled up the prints of the stones, which were gone into the building, and ordered the parts round the tower to be swept and made clean. So the virgins took brooms and swept, and cleared away all the refuse from the tower, and sprinkled water, and the place became pleasant and most seemly for the tower. All is now cleansed, said the shepherd unto me. If the Lord come to visit the tower, he will have no fault to find in us. When he had thus spoken, he would have gone his way. But I laid hold on his bag, and began to adjure him by the Lord, to explain to me the things he had showed me. For a little while, said he, I must be about my business. Afterwards I will interpret all things unto thee. Tarry for me here until I come. Alone here, sir, said I to him, what should I do? Thou art not alone, quoth he, for these virgins are with thee. Then present me to them, quoth I. Accordingly the shepherd called them to him, and said unto them, I commit this man to you until I come. And he departed 
So I was left alone with the virgins, and they were the more glad and entreated me courteously, especially the four of them, which were the more glorious. Chapter 11 Today said the virgins unto me, The shepherd cometh not hither. What then, quoth I, shall I do? Wait for him until the evening, quoth they. And if he come, he shall speak with thee. But if he come not, thou shalt abide with us until he cometh. I said unto them, I will tarry for him until the evening. And if he come not, I will go away home, and come back early in the morning. But they answered and said to me, Thou wast given in charge to us, thou mayest not depart from us. Where then, quoth I, shall I stay? Thou shalt sleep with us, quoth they, as a brother and not as a husband. For thou art our brother, and henceforward we are going to dwell with thee, for we love thee much. But I was ashamed to tarry with them. Then the one that seemed to be the chief of them began to kiss and embrace me, and the rest, and when they saw her embracing me, began themselves to kiss me, and lead me round the tower, and sport with me. And I seemed to have grown young again, and began on my part to sport with them, for some of them caroled, some danced, and some sang. And I, keeping silence, walked with them in a circle round the tower, and was merry with them. Now when it was evening, I would have gone home, and they suffered me not, but withheld me. So I stayed the night with them, and slept beside the tower, for the virgins strawed their linen tunics upon the ground, and laid me in the midst of them, and did nothing at all but pray. And I prayed with them without ceasing, and not less than they, and the virgins rejoiced that I so prayed. And I stayed there with the virgins till the morrow, until the second hour. Then the shepherd arrived, and said to the virgins, have ye done him any harm? Ask him, quoth they. I said to him, Sir, I was right glad to abide with them. On what, quoth he, did thou sup? I supped, sir, quoth I, on the words of the Lord the whole night. Did they receive thee well, quoth he? Yea, sir, quoth I. Now, quoth he, what wilt thou hear first? Sir, quoth I, even as thou showest me from the beginning, I pray thee, sir, that according as I shall inquire, thou wilt declare things unto me. As thou desirest, quoth he, I will interpret unto thee, and I will hide nothing at all from thee. Chapter 12 First of all, sir, quoth I, declare this unto me, what are the rock and the gate? This rock, quoth he, and likewise the gate, is the Son of God. How then, sir, quoth I, is the rock ancient, but the gate new? Hearken, quoth he, foolish man, and understand. The Son of God is elder than all his creation, so that he became his father's counselor concerning his creation. Therefore he is ancient. But the gate, sir, quoth I, why is that new? Because, quoth he, he was manifested in the last days of the consummation. For this cause the gate was new that such as should be saved might enter through it into the kingdom of God. Sawest thou, quoth he, that the stones which came in through the gate went into the building of the tower, whereas those which came not in through it were cast forth again into their own place? I saw, sir, quoth I. Even so, quoth he, none shall enter into the kingdom of God, except he receive the name of his Son. For if thou desire to enter into a city, and that that city be walled about, and have but one gate, canst thou enter into that city except by the gate which it hath? Nay, sir, for how else were it possible? If then thou canst not enter into that city except by the gate thereof, so quoth he, a man can enter none otherwise into the kingdom of God than through the name of his Son, who is beloved by him. Sawest thou, quoth he, the multitude building the tower? I saw them, sir, quoth I. They all, quoth he, are glorious angels, and by them the Lord is walled about. The gate is the Son of God. He is the one entry unto the Lord. None otherwise shall any one enter unto him than through his Son. 
sawest thou quoth he the six men and the glorious tall man in the midst of them walking round the tower and rejecting the stones from the building i saw them sir quoth i the glorious man quoth he is the son of god and those six are glorious angels who fence him on the right and on the left of these glorious angels quoth he none shall enter in unto god without him whosoever hath not received his name shall not enter into the kingdom of god chapter thirteen but the tower quoth i what is it this tower quoth he is the church and what are these virgins these quoth he are holy spirits and a man can in no wise be found in the kingdom of god unless they clothe him with their raiment for if thou receive the name only but receive not the raiment from them thou shalt profit nothing for as much as these virgins are powers of the son of god if thou bear the name but bear not his power in vain shalt thou bear his name the stones quoth he which thou sawest cast away these bear the name but put not on the clothing of the virgins of what kind sir quoth i is their clothing their very names quoth he are their clothing whosoever beareth the name of the son of god ought to bear their names also for the son himself beareth the names of these virgins all the stones quoth he which thou sawest go into the building of the tower presented by their hands and remain in the building are such as had put on the power of these virgins for this cause thou beholdest the tower made of one piece with the rock even so they who have believed in the lord through his son and who clothe themselves with these spirits shall become one spirit and one body and their garments of one hue the dwellings of such as these who bear the names of the virgins is in the tower the stones then sir quoth i which were cast away why were they cast away when they had passed through the gate and been put into the building of the tower by the hands of the virgins quoth he seeing thou carest for all these things and inquirest diligently hear about the stones that were cast away these all quoth he received the name of the son of god and received also the power of these virgins having then received these spirits they were strengthened and were with the servants of god and they had one spirit and one body and one clothing for they minded the same things and wrought righteousness but after a time they were enticed by the women thou sawest apparelled in black robes who had their shoulders exposed and their hair loose and were well shapen seeing these women they desired them and put on their power and put off the power of the virgins they were therefore cast away from the house of god and abandoned to those women but the men who were not deceived by their beauty abode in the house of god thou hast quoth he the interpretation of the castaways chapter fourteen what then sir quoth i if these men being such like repent and cast away the desires of these women and return to the virgins and walk in their power and in their works shall they not enter into the house of god they shall enter in quoth he if they cast away the works of these women and resume the power of the virgins and walk in their works for thereunto was there even an intermission of the building that if these should repent they might go into the building of the tower but if they repent not then others shall enter in and these shall be for ever cast out for all these things i thank the lord because he was moved with compassion toward all who call upon his name and sent forth the angel of repentance unto us who had sinned against him and renewed our spirit and when we were already perished and had no hope to live he restored our life now sir quoth i declare unto me wherefore the tower was not built on the ground but upon the rock and upon the gate because quoth he thou art foolish and without understanding thou inquirest i have need sir quoth i to ask thee about all things because i cannot understand anything at all 
for all the things are great and glorious and hard to be understood of men. Hearken, quoth he, the name of the Son of God is great and incomprehensible, and sustaineth the whole world. If, then, the whole creation is sustained by the Son of God, what thinkest thou of such as have been called by him, and bear the name of the Son of God, and walk in his commandments? Seest thou what manner of men he sustaineth? such as with their whole heart bear his name. He himself was made a foundation for them, and he sustaineth them gladly, because they are not ashamed to bear his name. Chapter 15 Declare to me, sir, quoth I, the names of the virgins, and those of the women clothed in the black robes. Here, quoth he, the names of the stronger virgins, which stood at the corners. The first is faith, the second is continence, the third power, the fourth patience, and the others that were stationed between them have the names of simplicity, innocence, purity, joy, truth, prudence, concord, love. Whoso beareth these names, and the name of the Son of God, shall have power to enter into the kingdom of God. Here also, quoth he, the names of the women in the black robes. Four of these likewise are stronger than the rest. The first is unfaith, the second incontinence, the third disobedience, the fourth deceit. And they that shall come after them are grief, wickedness, lewdness, anger, falsehood, folly, slander, hate. The servant of God who beareth these names shall see the kingdom of God indeed, but shall not enter therein. And the stones from the deep, sir, quoth I, which were fitted into the building, what are they? The first, quoth he, to wit the ten, which were laid in the foundations, are the first generation. The twenty-five are the second generation of just men. The thirty-five are prophets and ministers of God, and the forty are apostles and teachers of the preaching of the Son of God. Why then, sir, quoth I, did the virgins deliver these stones also, for the building of the tower, when they had carried them through the gates. Because these, quoth he, first bear these spirits, and they parted not at all from one another, neither the spirits from the men, nor the men from the spirits, but the spirits abode with them until their falling asleep. Had they not had these spirits with them, they would not have come to be of use for the building of this tower. Chapter 16. Sir, quoth I, declare yet something unto me. What seekest thou more? quoth he. Why was it, sir, quoth I, that the stones went up from the deep, and were placed in the building, when they already bear these spirits? They had need, quoth he, to ascend through water, that they might be made alive, for they could not else enter into the kingdom of God except they put off the deadness of their former life. Therefore these also who were fallen asleep received the seal of the Son of God and entered into the kingdom of God. For, quoth he, before a man hath borne the name of the Son of God, he is dead. But when he receiveth the seal, he putteth off his deadness and resumeth life. Now the seal is the water. They go down therefore dead into the water, and come up alive. So to them also this seal was preached, and they used it that they might enter into the kingdom of God. Wherefore, sir, quoth I, did the forty stones also go up with them from the deep, when they had the seal already? Because these, quoth he, being the apostles and teachers, who had preached the name of the Son of God, when they fell asleep in the power and faith of the Son of God, preached also to those asleep before them, and themselves gave them the seal of the preaching. They went down indeed with them into the water, and came up again. But these went both down alive, and came up again alive. Whereas those who were asleep before them went down dead, and came up alive. Through these, therefore, they were brought to life, and acquainted with the name of the Son of God. For this cause they also ascended with them, and were fitted with them into the building of the tower, and were builded together with them without being hewn, 
for they fell asleep in righteousness and in great purity, only they had not the seal. Thou hast therefore the explanation of these also. I have, sir, quoth I. Chapter 17 Now then, sir, declare unto me about the mountains. Why are their appearances unlike one another and various? Here, quoth he, these twelve mountains are twelve tribes which inhabit the whole world. The Son of God, therefore, was preached to these by the apostles. But explain to me, sir, why the mountains are various and each of a different appearance. Here, quoth he, these twelve tribes which inhabit the whole world are twelve nations, and they are diverse in understanding and in mind. So then, even as thou sawest the mountains various, such are also the diversities of the minds of the nations, and their understanding. I will also declare unto thee the character of each. First, sir, quoth I, explain this to me, the mountains being so different, how, when their stones were put into the building, did they turn bright with one color, like the stones also which had come up from the deep? Because, quoth he, all the nations which dwell under heaven, when they had heard and believed, were called by the name of the Son of God. So when they had received the seal, they were of one thought and mind, and had one faith and love, and bare the spirits of the virgins along with the name. Wherefore, the building of the tower became of one color, bright as the sun. But after they had entered into the same, and were become one body, some of them defiled themselves, and were cast out from the company of the righteous, and again became such as they were before, or rather even worse. Chapter 18 How, sir, quoth I, did they become worse when they had the knowledge of God? He who knoweth not God, and doeth wickedly, quoth he, hath a certain punishment for his wickedness. But he who hath had knowledge of God ought no longer to do wickedly, but to do well. If then one who ought to do well do wickedly, seemeth he not to commit the greater wickedness than one who knoweth not God? Therefore they who not having known God do wickedly are condemned to death, but they who have known God and seen his great acts, and yet do wickedly, shall be doubly punished and perish for ever. Thus shall the church of God be purified. As thou sawest the stones taken out from the tower, and given over unto the evil spirits, so they shall be cast out, and there shall be one body of the purified ones. Even as the tower became as if made of one stone after it had been purified, thus shall the church of God also be after it hath been purified, when the wicked and the hypocrites and blasphemers and double-minded and doers of all manner of wickedness have been cast out. After these have been cast out, the church of God shall be one body, one intent, one mind, one faith, one love. And then shall the Son of God rejoice and be glad of them, because he hath received back his people pure. All these things, sir, quoth I, are great and glorious. But further, sir, declare unto me the power of each mountain and their doing, that every soul trusting on the Lord may hear, and may laud his great and wonderful and glorious name. Here, quoth he, the diversity of the mountains and of the twelve nations. Chapter 19. The believers from the first mountain, which was the black one, are such as these, apostates and blasphemers against the Lord, and betrayers of the servants of God. For these there is no repentance, but only death. And therefore they are black, for their kind is a lawless one. The believers from the second, which was the barren mountain, are of this kind, hypocrites and teachers of wickedness. These are like unto the former ones, being such as bear no fruit of righteousness. For as their mountain is unfruitful, so such men have a name indeed, but are void of the faith, and there is no fruit of truth in them. Yet for these there is opportunity of repentance, for they will make haste to repent. But if they loiter, their death shall be with the former ones. Wherefore, sir, quoth I, is the repentance for these, but not for the first, when their behaviors are all but the same? 
For this cause, quoth he, repentance is set before them, because they blasphemed not their Lord, neither were betrayers of the servants of God. But through desire to get gain, they practiced hypocrisy, and every one of them taught according to the desires of sinful men. Howbeit they shall pay a certain penalty, but repentance is offered to them, because they became not blasphemers, neither betrayers. Chapter 20 The believers from the third mountain, which had thorns and briars, are such as these. Some are rich, and some are mixed up with many affairs. The briars are the rich, and the thorns are they who are mixed up with diverse affairs. These, therefore, who have entangled themselves with many diverse affairs, cleave not to the servants of God, but go astray, because they are choked by their occupations. And the rich hardly cleave unto the servants of God, for fear lest they should be asked for something by them. Hardly, therefore, shall such as they enter into the kingdom of God. For as it is hard to walk barefoot among briars, so for such as these it is hard to enter into the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, for all these there is repentance. But it must be speedy, so that, seeing what they failed to accomplish in the former times, they may now run back upon the days past, and do some good. If therefore they repent, and do some good, they shall live unto God. But if they abide in their doings, they shall be delivered unto those women, who will put them to death. Chapter 21 The believers from the fourth mountain, which had many herbs, green above, but dry at the roots, and some parched by the sun, are such as these, some double-minded, and some who have the Lord on their lips, but not in their heart. Wherefore their foundations are dry and without strength, and their words only live, but their works are dead. They who are such neither live nor are dead. They are like therefore unto the double-minded. For the double-minded are neither green nor dry. They neither live nor are dead. Even as their plants, when they saw the sun withered, so also the double-minded, when they hear tidings of affliction, by reason of their fearfulness turn idolaters, and are ashamed of the name of their Lord. Such men neither live nor are dead. Yet these two, if they repent quickly, may live. But if they repent not, they are already given over to the women who rob them of their life. Chapter 22 The believers from the fifth mountain, which had green herbs, and was rough, are of this kind. They are faithful but slow to learn, presumptuous and pleasers of their own selves, would-be knowers of all things, when they know nothing at all. Because of this, their presumptuousness prudence hath forsaken them, and senseless folly hath entered into them. They commend themselves as having wisdom, and choosing to be professing teachers, when they are without understanding. Because of this high-mindedness, many were made vain who exalted themselves. For a great demon is self-conceit and vain confidence. Many of these, therefore, were cast away. But some repented and believed, and submitted themselves to those who had understanding, having come to know their own folly. And to the residue also of this sort repentance is offered, for they were not wicked, but rather foolish and without understanding. These, if they repent, shall live unto God. But if they repent not, they shall dwell with the women who despise evil against them. Chapter 23 the believers from the sixth mountain, which had clefts great and small, and blighted herbs in the clefts, are of these kinds. Those with the small clefts are such as have quarrels with one another, and from their own evil speakings were blighted in the faith. Yet many of these repented, and the rest shall repent when they hear my commandments, for their evil speaking are of small account, and they will quickly repent. But they with the great clefts, are men who persevere in their slanderers, and grow resentful in their ragings against one another. These were flung away from the tower, and disallowed for the building thereof. Hardly therefore shall such like live. If God and our Lord, who hath the mastery of all things, and beareth rule over all his creation, remembereth not evil against those who confess their sins, 
but is forgiving shall man who is perishable and full of sins remember evil against a man as though he could destroy or save him i the angel of repentance say unto you as many as are of this persuasion put it away and repent and the lord shall heal your former sins if ye purge yourselves from this devil else ye shall be delivered unto him for death chapter twenty four the believers from the seventh mountain on which were green pleasant herbs and the whole mount was well liking and every kind of cattle and the fowls of heaven were feeding upon the herbs of that mountain and the herbs they fed upon grew the more thriving are such as these they were always simple and guileless and happy having nothing against one another but always rejoicing over the servants of god they were endued with the holy spirit of these virgins and continually had compassion upon every man and out of their labors they furnished every man without upbraiding or doubting the lord therefore seeing their singleness and perfect childness gave them increase in the labors of their hands and favored them in all their doing i the angel of repentance say unto you who are like such remain such and your seed shall never be blotted out for the lord hath proved you and written you in our number and all your seed shall dwell with the son of god for ye have received of his spirit chapter twenty five the believers from the eighth mountain where were the many springs and the whole creation of the lord was watered from the springs are such as these the apostles and teachers who preached to the whole world and taught the word of god reverently and purely and kept not back anything for evil desire but always walked in righteousness and truth even as they had received the holy ghost the passing of such as these is with the angels chapter twenty six the believers from the ninth mountain which was desert and had in it the creeping things and beasts hurtful to men are of this kind they with the spots are deacons who ministered amiss and plundered the living of widows and orphans and gat gain for themselves from the ministry which they had received to administer if therefore they continue in the same covetousness they are dead and have no hope of life but if they convert and discharge their ministry incorruptly they shall be able to live the scabbed ones are those who denied and turned not again unto their lord but being grown barren and desert not cleaving to the servants of god but keeping alone they destroy their own souls for as a vine left alone within a fence and treated with neglect is spoiled and wasted by the weeds and in time groweth wild and is no longer meet for its master's use so such men despair of themselves and having grown wild become unprofitable to their lord for these however there is repentance unless they be found to have denied from the heart but if one be found to have denied from his heart i know not if he can live this i say not for these days that a man after denying should be allowed repentance for it is impossible that one who is now going to deny his lord should be saved but for those who denied long ago there seemeth yet to be opportunity of repentance if then any one is about to repent let him be quick before the tower is finished off else he shall be wasted by the women unto death the stunted ones these are wily men and slanders and the beasts which thou sawest on the mountain are these also for as the beasts poison and destroy a man by their venom even so do the words of such persons corrupt and destroy a man these therefore are maimed in their faith by reason of the customs which they practice but some repented and were saved and the rest who are such may be saved if they repent but if they repent not they shall die by the hand of those women of whose power they are possessed chapter twenty seven the believers from the tenth mountain on which were trees sheltering sheep are such as these bishops given to hospitality who always gladly receive the servants of god into their houses without hypocrisy and they always shelter the destitute and widows by their ministry without ceasing and they behave themselves incorruptly at all times 
These, therefore, shall all be sheltered by the Lord continually. They who did such things are glorious in the sight of God, and their place is already with the angels, if they persevere to the end serving the Lord. Chapter 28 The believers from the eleventh mountain, whereon were very fruitful trees, decked with different kinds of fruits, are such as these. Sufferers for the sake of the name of the Son of God, who suffered readily with their whole heart, and give up their lives. Wherefore then, sir, quoth I, do all these trees bear fruits? But the fruits of some of them are fairer than those of others. Hearken, quoth he, all who ever suffered for the name are honorable with God, and the sins of all these were taken away, because they suffered for the name of the Son of God. But hear why their fruits are diverse and some more excellent. As many, quoth he, as were brought before authorities and questioned, and denied not, but suffered with a ready mind, these are in great honor with the Lord, and theirs is the fruit which excelleth. But the fruits of those who were fearful and in doubt, and reasoned in their hearts whether to deny or confess, and so suffered, are smaller, because this thought arose in their heart. For it is an evil thought that a servant should deny his own Lord. Take heed, therefore, ye who are thus purposed, lest this thought remain in your hearts, and ye die unto God. Ye who suffer for the sake of that name ought to glorify God, for that he hath counted you worthy to bear his name, and to have all your sins healed. Therefore count yourselves happy, yea, and think that one of you hath done some great thing, if he suffer for God's sake. The Lord graciously giveth you life, though ye perceive it not, for your sins were heavy upon you, and except ye had suffered for the name of the Lord, ye would have died unto God because of your sins. These things I say unto you, who doubt whether to deny or make confession. Confess that ye have the Lord, lest if ye deny ye be committed to prison. If the Gentiles punish their slaves, should any one of them deny his Lord, what think ye will the Lord who hath power over all do unto you? Put away, then, these thoughts from your hearts, that ye may forever live unto God. Chapter 29 The believers from the twelfth, which was the white mountain, are of this kind. They are as infant babes, in whose heart no thought of evil ariseth. They know not what wickedness is, but always continued in their infancy. Such, therefore, dwell without doubt in the kingdom of God, because in no matter of thing did they violate the commandments of God but they continued, as it were, infants all the days of their life, in the same mind. Such of you, quoth he, as shall so remain, and be as babes in whom is no guile, shall be more honorable than all those before said, for all babes are honorable with God, and chiefest before him. Happy therefore are ye, as many as remove wickednesses from you, and put on innocence. As firstlings of all, ye shall live unto God. After he had finished the parables of the mountains, I said unto him, Sir, now declare unto me concerning the stones which were taken from the plain and put into the building, instead of the stones that were taken out of the tower, and concerning the round ones which were put into the building, and those which were still round. Chapter 30 Here, quoth he, about all these likewise, the stones taken from the plain, which were put into the building of the tower, instead of the rejected ones, are the roots of this white mountain. Seeing then that the believers from this mountain were all found void of offense, the Lord of the tower orders these stones from the roots of this mountain to be cast into the building of the tower. For he knew that, if these went into the building of the tower, they would remain bright, and none of them would turn black. Whereas, if he had added stones from the other mountains, he would have had occasion again to visit and purge the tower. But these were all found white, being such as have believed or will believe, for they are of the self-same kind. Happy is this kind, for it is innocent. Hear now also about the round bright stones. All these are from this white mountain, but hear why they were found round. The riches had clouded and darkened them a little from the truth, 
and they never drew back from God, nor did any evil word proceed out of their mouth, but all equity and virtue of truth. When the Lord therefore had seen their disposition to favor the truth and remain good, he commanded their wealth to be cut down, yet not all of it to be taken from them, so that they might be able to do some good with what remained to them and live unto God, because they are of a goodly kind. Accordingly, they were cut down a little and placed in the building of this tower. Chapter 31 But the rest which remained still round and had not been fitted into the building, because they had not yet received the seal, were put back in their own place, for they were found very round. This world, therefore, and the vanities of their riches must be pared away from them, and then they shall be meet for the kingdom of God. For need is that that they should enter into the kingdom of God, because the Lord hath blessed this innocent kind. Of this kind none shall perish, for even though any of them, being tempted by a most wicked devil, should have committed some fault, he will quickly return unto his Lord. I, the angel of repentance, judge you all happy, as many as are blameless, as infants, for that your estate is good and honorable with God. I bid you all, therefore, as many as have received this seal, hold to singleness and bear no grudge, and continue not in your spite, nor in the memory of vexatious offenses. Be of one spirit, and mend these evil rents, and put them away from you, that the Lord of the sheep may rejoice over them. He shall rejoice indeed, if he find all sound, but if he find some of them scattered abroad, woe to the shepherds. And if even the shepherds themselves be found scattered, what shall they answer concerning their sheep? Will they say that they have been worried by the sheep? They would not be believed, for it is a thing incredible that a shepherd should be harmed by sheep, and he would be the more punished for his falsehood. Now I am the shepherd, and it is my bounden duty to give account of you. Chapter 32 Amend you therefore while the tower is yet being built. The Lord dwelleth in men who love peace for peace is dear unto him. But he is far off from the contentious and malicious. Give your spirit back to him, therefore whole as ye received it. For if, when thou hast given a new garment to a fuller whole, and desirest to receive it back whole, the fuller, notwithstanding, gives it back to thee rent, wilt thou receive it? Wilt thou not presently burn with anger, and charge him reproachfully, saying, that garment I gave unto thee whole, wherefore hast thou rent it, and made it useless? Because of the rent thou hast made therein, it cannot be used. Wouldest thou not say all this, even to a fuller, about a rent which he hath made in thy garment? If then thou art so vexed about thy garment, and complainest of not receiving it back whole, what thinkest thou the Lord will do to thee, when he gave thee a perfect spirit, and thou hast made it quite useless, so that it can be made no use of by its owner. For the use thereof began to be of no account when it had been damaged by thee. Will not then the Lord of that spirit destroy thee because of this thy deed? Assuredly, said I, he will so do to all whom he shall have found continuing mindful of offenses. Choose not, quoth he, to trample his mercy under foot, but rather glorify him because he is so patient towards your misdeeds, and is not as ye are. Repent, therefore, as is expedient for you. Chapter 33 All the things before written I, the shepherd, the angel of repentance, having declared and spoken with the servants of God, if then ye believe and attend to my words, and walk in them, amend your ways, ye shall be able to live. But if ye continue in malice and resentfulness, none such shall live unto God. All these things which I had to say have been said unto you. Then the shepherd said to me, Hast thou asked me about everything? Yea, sir, said I. Wherefore then, said he, dost thou not ask me 
about the print of the stones laid in the building, whereof we filled up the prints. I forget, sir, said I, hear now, quoth he, about them. These are they who have now heard my commandments and repented with their whole hearts. And when the Lord saw that their repentance was good and pure, and that they were able to continue in it, he commanded their former sins to be blotted out. For these prints were their sins, and they were made even that they might not appear. Tenth Similitude, Chapter 1 After I had written out this book, the angel which had delivered me to the shepherd came into the house where I was, and sat down on the couch, and the shepherd stood on the right hand. Then he called me and spake thus to me, I have delivered thee and thine house, quoth he, to this shepherd, that thou mayest be protected by him. Yea, sir, quoth I, if therefore, quoth he, thou wilt be protected from all vexation and all harshness, and have success in every good work and word and every virtue of righteousness, walk in his commandments, which I have given unto thee, and thou shalt be able to have the mastery over all wickedness. For while thou keepest his commandments, every lust and delight of this world shall be subject unto thee, and success in every good thing shall follow thee. Take his gravity and modesty upon thee, and say unto all that he is in great honor and dignity with the Lord, and that he is set in great authority and powerful in his office. To him alone is the power of repentance committed in all the world. Seemeth he not to thee to be powerful? Yet he condemn his gravity and the respect which he hath towards you. Chapter 2 I said to him, Ask him, sir, whether since he hath been in my house I have done aught disorderly, whereby I have offended against him. I also know, quoth he, that thou hast not done, neither wilt thou do, aught disorderly, and therefore I speak these things with thee, that thou mayest persevere, for he hath given me a good account of thee, and do thou speak these words to others, that they who have repented, or are about to repent, may think the same things with thee, and he may give a good report of them to me, and I unto the Lord. I for my part, sir, quoth he, proclaim to every man the mighty acts of the Lord, for I trust that all who have sinned before time, if they hear these things, will repent with a willing mind, and recover life. Continue steadfast, therefore, quoth he, in this ministry, and accomplish it. All as such as fulfill his commandments shall have life, but they who keep not his commandments flee from their life and turn away from it, for he hath great honor with God. They therefore who despise him and follow not his commandments deliver themselves to death, and every one such becometh guilty of his own blood. I bid thee therefore be subject unto these commandments, and thou shalt have healing of thy sins. Chapter 3 Now I have sent unto thee these virgins to dwell with thee, for I saw that they were courteous towards thee, so thou hast them for helpers, that thou mayest the better keep his commandments, for without these virgins it is impossible that these commandments should be kept. I see indeed that they are glad to dwell with thee, but I will enjoin them not to depart at all from thine house. Do thou only cleanse thine house, for in a clean house they will be pleased to dwell, for as much as they are cleanly and chaste and diligent, and are in all favor with the Lord. If therefore they find thine house pure, they will abide with thee, but if the least taint befall, they will presently depart from thine house. For these virgins love not any manner of defilement, I said to him, I hope, sir, that I shall so please them, that they will be content always to dwell in my house, and that as he to whom thou hast delivered me lay no complaint against me, so neither will they complain. Then he said to the shepherd, I see that the servant of God hath desired to live, and will keep these commandments, and will lodge these virgins in a pure habitation. When he had thus spoken, he delivered me to the shepherd, and called the virgins, and said unto them, For as much as I perceive that ye gladly dwell in this man's house, I commit him and his house unto you, to the intent that ye may never at all depart from his house. And they willingly heard these words. Chapter 4 
Then he said to me, Quit thee manfully in this ministry, rehearse unto every man the mighty acts of the Lord, and thou shalt find favor in his ministry. Whoso walketh in these commandments shall live and be happy in his life, but whoso disregardeth them shall not live, and shall be unhappy in his life. Say unto all who are able to do aright, that they cease not to exercise themselves in good works, for that is profitable unto them. Now I say that every man ought to be delivered from distresses, for he who hath need and suffers distresses in his daily life is in great anguish and necessity. Whoso therefore rescueth the soul of such an one from straightness getteth great joy to himself. For he who is afflicted with this manner of distress is racked and tormenteth himself with the like torment as one who is in bonds. Many indeed, because of such miseries, such as they are not able to bear, bring death upon themselves. He who knoweth therefore the calamity of such an one, and deliver him not, committeth a great sin, and is guilty of his blood. Do good works therefore, ye who have received from the Lord, lest while ye delay to do them, the building of the tower be finished. For for your sakes the work of the building of it hath been delayed. Except then ye make haste to do aright, the tower shall be finished, and ye shall be shut out. After he had spoken with me, he arose from the couch, and he took the shepherd and the virgins and departed, saying, however to me, that he would send back the shepherd and the virgins to my house. End of Similitude 9 and 10 End of the Shepherd of Hermas by Hermas Translated by Charles Taylor